Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Gordla Weiss-Sussex. I'm professor of German at the uh, Institute of Modern Languages Research. Um, and on behalf of the IMLR and all the organizers, um, I'd like to welcome you to this conversation on future directions in modern languages. Um, so the meeting is convened not just by the IMLR, but uh, by the AURI projects, UCML, Bilingualism Matters, and the AULC. And I'm really grateful to everyone involved in making it happen. I'm also very grateful to all the speakers who agreed to share their ideas. Um, we feel that this event is happening at a crucial time, uh, at a crucial point of the definition and the development of our discipline. It is so very timely because several things are coming together. Um, the AURI projects have delivered their uh, results and their recommendations uh, for uh, follow-up actions, research and implementations. Um, the appointment of the AHRC fellows working on the future of languages research has happened and they don't have an awful lot of time to work on their uh, on their remit, um, so they probably have to hit the ground running. Um, the uh, subject benchmarking process is uh, underway, and also um, there's a growing awareness uh, that we need to consider community languages and global languages uh, in a much stronger way than we have so far in thinking about disciplinarity uh, of, our, of, of our discipline. So all of these points will be considered today, and I think importantly, all these points will be considered in conjunction, in conjunction with one another. So we're hoping that by bringing together all these strands and through this collaboration, we enable joined up thinking and in that way, continue the work that has been done by the HSC Leadership Fellow and by the British Academy. Um, of course, stock taking has been happening before and is ongoing and is important to be ongoing. But I really just want to stress again that I think we are at a moment where it's imperative to agree on concrete action on how to move forward, um, how to determine frameworks and create greater cohesion and thereby also greater impact for modern languages, research, teaching and policy. So that's, that's quite an ambitious aim for today. And therefore, we'll keep the presentations really short, introductions really short, to have that room for discussion and to be able to formulate action points coming out of it. So that's, that's, that's just as a, as a short intro. Let me just say a couple of points on housekeeping. We'll all stay muted as a default. If you have a question, please either raise your digital hand or put your question in the chat. We'll pick that up. Um, and also a reminder, the event is recorded, so if you do not wish to be recorded or, video on, or uh, appear on, on video, please submit your question in the chat. I'll now hand over to Charles Burdett for a quick welcome before we hear from the AHRC fellows. Thank you, Gordela. Um, I'd just like to say a few words um, following on from what Gordela has said. Today is about taking key points and working out how we organise events of this kind in the future. We want to organise more events that are about condensed strategic thinking. As Gordela said, this is a crucial juncture for our disciplinary field with the coming to the end of the cycle of the AURI project, the development of national strategy for languages. Uh, that Janice and Neil have devoted an, an enormous amount of time and energy to, and many others, the appointment of the three AHRC fellows, subject benchmarking. At the moment, I think we do have an opportunity to build on the work of the large research themes, both translating cultures and the Aori project, to address some of the issues that make the environment in which we work more difficult than it needs to be for our subject area, and particularly for postgraduates and early career researchers. And it is, again, as Gordela said, crucial for the representative bodies of the subject area, the British Academy, the UCML, AMLUC, ALC, uh, to be working very closely together and to be agreeing upon and disseminating 
ideas and strategies. For that to happen in the most effective way possible, we have to carry forward and indeed accelerate work on the underlying framework and narrative of the subject area. If the work of major projects, and OURI is certainly major, with all their collaborations and co-produced research is to be fully valued, then it needs to impact on a recognizable disciplinary framework. There is, and I think we all know this, there is a risk of projects carrying out really excellent work, but that work not having the legacy that it deserves because it is not embedded in existing structures. So that dialogue between our subject area and the work project do needs all the time to be ongoing and purposeful. In this context, it's important for us to get beyond any sense of competition between different elements of the subject area and to be thinking much more in terms of a broad but nevertheless definable disciplinary field that obviously has different emphases and inflections, but which is, as I say, recognizable and connected by such elements as the integrated study of language, culture, and society. The fact that we do not write simply about a given geographical or language area, but from within that area that we address the relation of local linguistic or cultural practices to wider global concerns, and that in everything we do, there is a strong emphasis on cultural and linguistic mobility. And of course, I could go on. Lastly, visibility is all important, both within the sector and more importantly, within society as a whole. It's highly important that we demonstrate the contemporary impact of the analytical frameworks concerning both the past and the present that we use and that we are deeply involved in cross-disciplinary research and that we disseminate that through uh, various um, means that are at our disposal. For example, languages, society and policy, the journal. Just before passing the word on to the three AHRC fellows, I would just like to say a couple of words about the IMLR. Firstly, the postgraduate training program that we offer is hugely appreciated, but it's only possible because it articulates with a disciplinary structure. It moves and changes, as does the subject field. So what we talk about now is very, very relevant to all that we do. Secondly, the IMLR has been doing a lot of work with schools and community groups as part of uh, its participation in the OURI scheme and our participation in the global program, Bilingualism Matters. We will certainly be developing that part of our work and seeking to amplify the value of research by promoting more formal connections with teaching associations. We have to be thinking about the educational sector as a whole. The IMLR, thirdly, has a newly established center, the Center for Latin American and uh, Caribbean Studies emerging from ILAS, which brings with it a strong element of social sciences, and we will be changing our name to better reflect the range of what we do. There is discussion to be had as to whether modern languages best reflect what we do in all its shape and form. The School of Advanced Study, of which we are a part, has a new strategy that positions the school so that it does not replicate the work of other universities, that advances cross-disciplinary research and gives high visibility to the importance of the humanities. How we work through and develop that strategy is a question of our engagement with the subject community. So our strategy will evolve and we will be organizing events of this kind uh, more and more. And we will be coming to places to talk about the role of the IMLR in the context of subject benchmarking, in the context of the work of the HRC fellows, and in the context, as Gordela said, about developing a much stronger connection between all elements of, uh, uh, of the disciplinary field and all areas of language uh, and culture. Uh, and I'm gonna stop there. Um, what we want to do in the conclusion to today is very much taking a series of action points. But let me pass the word now 
to back to Gordela. Thank you very much, Charles. Um, so I think we move directly on to hear from the uh, HRC fellows. So the HRC has appointed research fellows to scope the future of languages research, to identify new themes and work towards policies for the future. Of course, that's a huge responsibility, really, because it will impact on our research landscapes for years to come. Um, possible future funding and investment will all depend on, uh, on these uh, themes identified. So all three have agreed to give us a brief outline of their positions and plans, and then to take questions. We have Emmanuel Labo, who is a reader in French language and linguistics, and she's also the director of the Aston Center for Applied Linguistics at Aston University. Uh, Michelle McLeod, professor of Gaelic and director of the Confucius Institute at the University of Aberdeen. And Nicola McClelland, professor of German and history of linguistics. And she's also the head of School of Cultures, Languages and Area Studies at the University of Nottingham. Thank you very much, all three of you for coming. And Nicola, you'll kick off, I understand. That's right. So um, hello, everybody from Emmanuel, Michelle and me. Um, I'm going to start off by sharing our presentation and then the others are going to take over, but I'm still going to be clicking. So you guys might need to shout at me when it's time to uh, move on the slide. OK, so just to quickly share my screen. Uh, has that worked, everybody? Yep. OK, great. So. Um, as uh, Gordla has um, just introduced us, we are commissioned by the AHRC, the three of us, to undertake uh, some scoping of the future of language research. Uh, and I'll say a little bit more about that in, the mo in a moment. What I first want to say, do is kind of present to you almost in the AHRC language, um, uh, what the, the brief is that we are answering. So they want us to look at uh, potential threats, risks, emerging issues, opportunities, comparing AHRC current funding with desired results. Um, and I think it's important to note that the remit here is global languages, which definitely absolutely encompasses what we might or might not want to call modern languages, depending on your view, uh, but certainly also indigenous languages, non so UK's indigenous uh, languages, non-European languages, community languages, sign languages, um, and we are asked to identify new and emerging research themes, relevant policy areas that languages research could address, um, including things that concern academic and non-academic communities, wider stakeholders, government departments, and interestingly, those that do not usually receive funding from the AHRC. So that is the spec that we were, are all responding to. And the outcome is uh, a report that we will submit to the executive team of the AHRC. Um, by, I think uh, it was meant to be end of May, we've been allowed to have a little bit longer mid-June, uh, but still pretty tight turnaround time. Um, so you'll be hearing, I hope, lots from us quite shortly. Um, so the kind of recommendations that we think we will be um, uh, contributing to this report are recommendations around things like thematic calls to galvanize new research in emerging or underrepresented strategically promising areas, um, adjustments to the AHRC um, remits, perhaps, to enable languages research to innovate in order to address government areas of research interest, which is definitely something that the AHRC put quite strongly in the call, while nevertheless not losing sense of our core identity as languages uh, researchers in the sense that um, Charles has outlined it. Uh, I think it's really important that we keep our sense of core identity in our remit while still um, stretching in the direction that um, the HRC, to some extent, uh, driven by UKRI and government priorities, wants us to head in. Um, and then recommendations to the AHRC itself, but perhaps also for subject associations might be useful for activities and funding opportunities that might actually help scaffold us from where we are now, uh, at least partially, towards new directions, um, new research and impact opportunities. So that's kind of the big picture. Um, I already said on the, uh, 
with regard to the first slide, the remit of languages research, research is very broad. I think the other thing to emphasize really firmly is that this is not languages as in if you do linguistics, that type of research. And you could easily, I think, have got that impression just because of who has ended up being appointed. You know, I've got linguistics in my title along with German. Um, Emmanuel is in language and linguistics. Um, Michelle works on indigenous languages, but actually we all of us uh, um, of the UK, but we all of us are absolutely committed to a project for for the community of languages um, and societies and cultures research in its broadest sense. And, and I'm just going to hammer that home a little bit more personally for me. OK, so I am uh, a German linguist, really, but I started off in medieval literature. Um, I head a school that has got French, German, Russian and Slavonic studies, uh, Spanish, Latin American studies. Um, Serbian Croatian is in there. We teach Chinese. Um, I have studied a, a number of languages to various levels of success. Spanish is probably actually the worst one of all of those that I've listed. Um, uh, so I'm, I think I want you to have confidence in us that we absolutely are not here peddling our own private agendas. This is absolutely something we want to do for the community in its um, widest sense. Um, and I think perhaps the other thing to emphasize is that is there's certainly no expectation that the open calls, the so-called um, curiosity-driven um, uh, uh, calls from the HRC will ever stop. So it's not that we're never going to be able to, uh, whether we're all going to have to follow particular agendas, that is always going to be there, but I think that's important to note as well. So I'm going to move on now to um, my uh, couple of um, slides about what I'm going to do. I think my uh, description of the project was perhaps most general um, and the other two, Michelle and Emmanuel, have got particular um, emphases, which I think make it a really nice fit between the, the three of us. I hope um, you'll be convinced of that as well. So, I mean, I, I as summarised the HRC, my aim is to find out where we're really at in terms of languages, cultures and societies research um, regarding the areas of specialism, the methods, the kinds of outputs and the kinds of impacts um, and to ascertain what is still emerging, where there might be gaps, what's underrepresented. And, and then this is actually the core of it, really, to complete a gap analysis to some extent between where we are now and what is excellent about that and some future yet to be determined ideal state of languages research and how we actually get there and how the, we might ask the AHRC to support us um, in getting there. Um, how are we going to go about this? Um, we are able to draw on quite a lot of data um, from the AHRC about funding thus far, um, success rates and such like, not just from the AHRC, but also from other key funding schemes through, for example, Leverhulme and British Academy, which I think will be very useful for us to get a picture of what actually is working and, and who's getting the funding, how is it distributed. We have really importantly um, a questionnaire that will be coming out for uh, everybody in the languages community, anyone who understands themselves as doing linguistics research. Strike that from the record that needs to be edited. Uh, anyone who is doing languages, cultures and societies research, including linguistics, um, uh, uh, who understands themselves to be doing that in any form at whatever career stage. And we really want to hear from everyone. That includes people who are PhD students. For technical reasons, we have actually a, a different survey for them, but that was only because the routing of questions that we needed to ask was a little bit different. They are it'll all go into the same data set. We absolutely want to hear from uh, people who are not in their ideal permanent full-time position, but who are still consider themselves languages researchers. We want to hear from everybody, whatever career stage you're at. And that also includes the people who've been in the same job for 25 years plus. Um, so please, the one thing I want you to take away from this is when that questionnaire comes out, please, please, please encourage uh, your colleagues and everyone you know to fill it out because the more responses we get, the more credible the data that we can feed back to the AHRC will be and it will inform our recommendations. Um, 
At the end of that questionnaire, which I think may even come out next week, we're just waiting for ethical approval, um, there is an opportunity. Uh, the questionnaire itself is completely anonymous, as indeed it should be, but there's a separate link where you can then, if you want, uh, contact us to be involved in interviews and focus groups to follow up some of the questions that will emerge. We ask quite a lot in the questionnaire. There's an awful lot of ticking boxes and saying yes or no. And I think a lot of people will be saying no to lots of things. Um, but that's really important for us to know as well. I, I just can't emphasize enough. So please ask people to slog through to the end. There are opportunities to leave open comments as well, but not in the slightest to be disheartened if you are just going no to lots of the questions. We, you are absolutely the people um, we want to hear from. Um, so uh, we're hoping that as a result of that, we'll have input from um, subject associations, award holders, um, early, early career researchers, postgraduates, everybody who, who's involved. Um, and we are using the University of Nottingham's networks with um, uh, beyond academia, out into business, government, wider stakeholders. Um, again, that's at quite an early stage. I can't say too much about that because we haven't got the ethical approval through yet, but we really will be trying to talk to some of the people that I think as languages academics, some of us already are great at having those relationships, some are not so um, uh, confident, and we'll be finding out what they want to know and trying to bridge the, the gap between um, things that they're interested in and what we can uh, contribute from our home of languages, cultures and societies research. And as I think I've banged on quite emphatically about, we are seeking representativeness of the languages research landscape. One thing I want to add, and I feel really bad about this, it just occurred to me as I was speaking, I have said we all the way through. My project um, incorporates, uh, also has a postdoc researcher on it, Katie Harrison, Dr. Katie Harrison. Um, and she's not he, uh, here today, but I absolutely should emphasize that uh, when I say we and survey questionnaire, she is doing an awful lot of the, the heavy lifting on that and um, really, really lucky to have her um, as part of the project. So I think that's my slides finished and I'm gonna move on now to Michelle. And do you want to just shout at me when you're ready to move on, Michelle? Will do, thanks. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to keep it fairly brief. I am on day five, I think, of COVID. Not feeling brilliant, but I definitely wanted to be here, so don't feel too sorry for me, and I'll try to make sense in between coughing and whatnot. Um, so I think just to follow on something that Nicola spoke about and she indicated, um, we are three research fellows who applied to the same call with similar yet different ideas. And uh, my particular interest while responding to the call was to look specifically at the UK's indigenous languages. Um, so we've been, we didn't apply. I think, it's, I think it might be worth people knowing we didn't apply as a group. Uh, we applied separately and have been happily put together in some kind of arranged um, trio uh, and so far it's working really well that we've all got different experiences and strengths um, to, to bring to the project. So obviously my background is in um, minority languages, specifically Gaelic, Scottish Gaelic, although I have done some collaborative research with researchers in the other minority languages, uh, particularly Welsh and Irish, uh, a little bit with Scots. I have been uh, a head of a, a school which contains other languages, so French, German, Spanish. So I have got an eye for what's been happening with the other, um, some of the other languages and language research. But specifically, I'm going to be looking at um, what's happening with Gaelic, Irish, Welsh, Manx, Cornish, Scots, Ulster Scots, and also I'm going to look at British Sign Language um, and, and to see what research is happening there and what are the emerging themes. So I'm going to piggyback quite a bit on the survey that um, Nicola is sending out and kind of hopefully be able to uh, get a, a slightly separate data set as well from that for, for these um, language areas. I'm going to look, work quite a bit with external stakeholders, um, 
obviously many of our minority languages are subject to specific government policies and interventions. And I want to understand to what extent university research interfaces with these language agencies and the government departments um, and third sector organizations as well. There's a, a large number of third sector organizations working with um, our indigenous languages across um, these islands, um, which also commission research. Sometimes they work with university departments, sometimes not. So I want to get a, a handle on that. <clears throat> I also, um, as part of the HRC brief, want to consider how our understanding of minority language research and using research, what, what research needs to be done, can be used as a tool for improving social inclusion. Um, and I'm going to explore a little bit with some of the agencies that have identified, and I've identified a lot of agencies that um, have a a linguistic, a language responsibility, uh, and talk to them about intangible cultural heritage and uh, potential areas of research there. So if we can move on a slide, please, Nicola. <laughs> Is it moving on, Nicola? Thanks. Um, so I want to engage with, uh, particularly with researchers who, who work with uh, the minority languages, so particularly but not uniquely um, my colleagues who work in Celtic departments, um, and I'm very keen and I'm very delighted to have had the opportunity to, to do this work because I, I feel an I hope I'm not speaking just from a personal experience, but I think that sometimes um, researchers who work in minority languages don't always, and the indigenous languages don't always interact very closely with what's going on with the, um, with the other languages. So I think this is really a good opportunity to, to bring um, the different cohorts of language researchers and language research together a bit more. Um, as I said, I'm doing a bit of desk-based research at the moment. Uh, there's a huge amount of research that's been commissioned by language culture heritage agencies, not just government organizations, not just arm's length, uh, non-departmental public bodies, but also third sector organizations. And I want to understand what it is they have done what kinds of research they have done, to what extent that has been um, done in-house, what types of commissioning processes they've done, and so on. Um, I plan, and I've already started, interviewing across the, across the aisles again uh, with senior stakeholders in language agencies and cultural agencies, and also at government level, talking to uh, primarily the devolved governments about their policies around language. We will also, and I'm using a we as well because I now am very fortunate to have a, a postdoc research assistant working with me who um, is very expert at data and gathering data and data analysis and uh, comes from a different minority language background to my own so can, can keep me well informed there um, and she will help me with questionnaires. Uh, questionnaire this time not just for, not at all for the academic researchers. I'm not going to have separate questionnaire for the academic researchers. I think that's important that we don't overload the same people looking for the same information twice, but I'll be going out to um, cultural and heritage groups across um, the islands uh, looking for um, their experience of language, their understanding of culture, heritage, language, and also their research uh, experiences and their research needs. And I shall leave it at that and have a week off now. Hello everybody, now it's my turn. And before introducing my, my project, I wanted to introduce you to a bunch of lovely young people. Uh, those are actually my first year language student this year. And I suspect that my class may look a bit different from uh, yours. Uh, there is definitely 
uh, some uh, BAME um, um, majority in my students. We've got some local Asian students, um, lots of black students, some of which have got some French uh, speaking background, others not, even some uh, Portuguese background. But uh, this is a, a fairly unusual um, mix of, of people. Why are they there? Well, some of them, because they're just interested in the kind of programs we offer at Aston that are very practical, like IBML, International uh, Business and Modern Languages, very practical, uh, involving teaching in, in the foreign language. And let's face it as well, some of them are there because they didn't get the grade to, to get into a more prestigious university. Next slide, uh, please, Nicola. But you may have heard about this. And those young people are very fortunate, not only because they are in my class, of course, but because if they were only one year younger, they wouldn't probably study uh, languages at a university. Yes, some of them may uh, go to another university next year, but for, for some of them, there won't be that um, possibility and that opportunity. So this has been really my inspiration in, in the project, because uh, when closures of uh, a department happens, we think, oh, that's horrible for, for the staff, but it's also horrible for the students, because for, for some people, this is a life Line. This is getting out of some um, life plan that, that was in front of them, and it opens new door to, to be able to go to university. So this is for those people that I'm working. Next slide, please. So my project is a very much personal, and it is called BRUM. Birmingham Research for Upholding Multilingualism. I confess that I had to brum first and I had to find a word afterwards, but I think I managed quite nicely. So what I want to do in my project is to bring a, another voice to uh, the consultation, basically the voice of the underdog. And I want to do some kind of horizon scanning uh, of languages in Birmingham by documenting the, the presence of languages in various areas that are not uh, necessarily academic. So I'm um, focusing especially on education, business, public services, and culture. The idea is to, to have a very inclusive pro uh, project that uh, feed into the discussion, the opinion of uh, non-academic stakeholders, and to hear their view about the areas they, they need uh, to, to be researched, how we could support them as researchers working on languages in doing whatever they're doing. My plan is also to talk to people who don't know that they need languages and think that maybe languages is an inconvenience and everything would be so much easier if everybody spoke English. So maybe listen to them and actually identify and highlight to them what languages could bring to their own interests. So I want to identify real life needs for language research. That doesn't mean that uh, I don't like uh, research for the sake of it. I mean, I've just completed a, a monograph on the French past historic. And to be honest, I don't see many social applications for it. I just enjoy doing that. But I think that as academic, we also have an obligation to think of what we can bring and pay back to society. So let's try also to see what we can do for real. Next slide, please. At Aston, there is already a lot of thing happening around uh, languages that is very much locally centered. Uh, some of you know about the, the thriving uh, group of Roots into Languages West Midlands that we, we used to have until last summer. And we obviously have lots of contacts with local school through that. We also have uh, Learning Through Languages UK, which is a consortium of university, cultural association, teachers uh, that I, I convened that we launched about, um, well, three and a half years ago. 
And we are, we're trying to, to promote the, the use of clear content and language integrated learning as one of the options to uh, help address the language deficit in uh, UK education. We're doing things such as offering a training. Uh, we have a monthly uh, online seminar, Clear Mondays, where we've got both academics sharing their research, but also practitioners sharing good practical ideas they, they use uh, in, in their class. There are also projects in other areas of the university, like CRIM, uh, led by Professor Mondoram, which is a wonderful center, I think, that is supporting micro businesses by people from uh, minority uh, backgrounds, uh, people who may be, for example, refugees who are gifted uh, business people, but who are struggling because of language barriers. So we would like to, to be able to, to work together uh, with, with such initiatives. We also have lots of NHS links. For example, during the pandemic, some of my colleagues in translation studies did a wonderful job in um, developing resources to support community interpreter and translator to um, convey uh, the safety messages to their own community. So what I will be doing is consulting stakeholder in education, business, public services and culture by interview, by focus group. For example, we want to talk to a local interpreter to see the needs they, they have in uh, their daily practice. And we, we have lots of contacts with them through our Institute of Forensic Linguistics, where there is a lot of dealing uh, between the police and interpreters. Uh, also questionnaire for, for teachers, because there, there is also the, the problem that if we want to have languages uh, at uh, university level, if we want to have those students paying uh, for university research or to, to do their research, we also need to work in cooperation with education at, at all level. Because uh, if we don't have a supply of teachers that we train, well, there won't be classes in school and obviously we won't have students in the, the future. So we have to work uh, together. I'm very keen also of getting other types of data and I, I will be trying to crowdsource a lot of data. For example, we've got a, a equality, diversity and inclusion week coming at Aston and I've managed to uh, convince them that it would be a good idea to, to have a, a survey on the mother tongues of people uh, studying and working at Aston and obviously that could bring some very interesting uh, insight at the time where Aston is still considering whether or not they will keep their uh, university white language provision. Um, we're also trying to launch uh, a Birmingham version of Linguista. You may have heard of it through uh, the wonderful work of uh, Yaron Matras at Manchester. And we would like to, to make the most of the Commonwealth Games uh, this um, summer uh, to do a little exhibition in the street of Birmingham about uh, the, the diversity of languages in the, the city and hopefully to also invite people to contribute to Linguesnap Brum if it's working and that's beyond my own uh, remit so uh, I can only cross all my fingers for, for this to, to work. So Birmingham is a case study, very central, so I guess the kind of uh, discoveries and findings I, I will have through this project will also be uh, applicable to other places in the UK. Uh, next slide, that's Nicola. So I just wanted to, to reiterate uh, the call that my, my colleagues have already expressed. We need you because uh, it's not about what we think should be said. Well, we have ideas, but obviously you have yours. And uh, even if we try to be as involved and engaged as we can uh, in our community, you will have insight we don't have. So please uh, answer our invitation, uh, tell us, what you think, share your ideas, and you have here uh, our uh, email address. So please uh, feel very free to get in touch. We want to hear from, from you. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, all three of you. That was very, very clear and, and really, really uh, interesting. I, I, I really liked it. Was became very clear how broad your understanding of your remit is, um, or how complementary your projects are as well. Um, and uh, but but you all have this main interest, this core interest in language and. Uh, social inclusion, and I think that's you know that's that's really absolutely crucial. There, um, there are some obvious links, and I think it's wonderful that you have these links. You know, for instance, I was thinking um, when you were speaking, Emmanuel. You know, I was I was the whole time I was thinking about the multilingual Manchester project. You know, this, there's there's so much that's already existing that 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 can feed into this. So I I think that's that's brilliant. I have a couple of questions that didn't really come up. If you could say something about, my first question is, how do you see um, your uh, input in developing further cross-disciplinary collaboration between languages, research, and other disciplines? That's my first question. And my second question is, Nicola, you spoke about the gap analysis between where we are and where ideally we want to be. How do we know where we want to be? Well, that is the 10 gazillion dollar question to answer that one first. Um, and I think the, the speaking very personally and frankly here, I think where we want to be is probably a balancing act between where the AHRC wants us to be and where we as a discipline that isn't just UK or as a collection of disciplines that aren't just answering to UK priorities um, want to be. So I think we need to be, the future ideal state is bridging that gap between, you know, the monograph on the past historic that Emmanuel mentioned um, and uh, the responsibility to address some of the, you know, the real life challenges, social inclusion, for example, but not just that. There are many other ways that we um, can enrich um, UK economic life and society. So how exactly we articulate that is, you know, is a is going to take some intellectual thought. Absolutely. And um, we will be thinking really hard about that. But again, just to bang on ad nauseum, we really want to hear other people's thoughts. And I think to, to answer, to give as credible an answer as possible, we need to have a sense of what new directions people are already going in, because some of that you kind of know anecdotally, but it would be really great to have the data for that. What was the first question again? Interdisciplinary thing. Oh, yeah. I, I you guess want to I, take that, Emmanuel? Yeah, yeah, I guess um, focusing on a specific place, Birmingham, and on an institution where basically we've had a lot of practice in the, the last year in trying to justify our own existence and where it has been vital to, to show how we were useful uh, interdisciplinary, how we could work together with other arenas in the university has been quite central. So we, we've got a head start in a way at the local level. So I guess all that thinking uh, we've had about how uh, languages uh, can inform, for example, business practice, uh, can inform uh, maybe work together with psychology um, and um, medical humanities, things like that. This is something we, we've been thinking uh, out of necessity sometimes. And uh, so I guess those small scale conclusion could, could give also an insight of what could be done at a larger scale. And I guess by focusing on a fairly small lab, um, this is a way of looking at, at what the future might look like. And hopefully the future is bright and not bleak. <laughs> There time to add just one quick sentence, God like it. Um, I, I would just want to um, second all of that, but just add, I think it's really important that when we talk about interdisciplinarity and multidisciplinarity, we are um, making sure that this is languages led research or at least completely collaborative and that we're not heading, I mean, ancillary adding on to other people's research is great, but it's really important that we don't see our future as just being ancillary to other Project. So that would be my note of caution, pre having looked at any of the data that I would want to be careful.
careful about as we articulate our recommendations. I agree, that's crucial. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, we have a few minutes for, for questions. Uh, so if, if there are any questions, I'm very happy to take them now. Um, if not, it really, you know, was, oh yeah, Pet Petros, uh, Petros, would you like to ask a question? Yes, uh, thank you so much, Laura, and thank you, Nicola, um, Emmanuel, and Michelle for this. It's, it's really fascinating. I was wondering, in terms of the underrepresented research that um, you mentioned as part of your, your aims. So, uh, could you say a little bit more about how you're going to go about establishing what is underrepresented? Because if it's underrepresented, how will it come onto your radar uh, and how will um, you ensure that what is truly underrepresented is included in your, in your report? Can I take that maybe to start? As I said in my project, I'm trying to talk to um, people who are not maybe the first people AHRC and funding bodies would go to, people who uh, may not uh, really know about the, those funding and people who may not even think that languages have got anything to bring to their own discipline. So I guess by looking at the needs that maybe they have in school, how we can support uh, the teaching of languages in schools, by talking to uh, other stakeholders who are not aware that there is a problem linked with, with languages, but by listening to them, well, it just appears that there are things we, we could bring to them. I guess by bringing together uh, unusual suspect, you, you can um, provoke new ways of thinking. And, you know, sometimes out of a conversation, uh, you have something that comes out that you haven't planned at all. And, um, in my own project, I, I'm really ready for those kind of conversation and I'm ready to be surprised and uh, to come with new ideas. So that was my bit. Um, yeah, I mean, I would add, I think, um, so the call to look at underrepresented research, that's in part of the AHRC's call. I think we will partly interpret that as underrepresented in funding from the AHRC. Um, and so there it's a question of finding out partly through the, the questionnaire that we have, what people are doing and what is getting funding and to what extent they match up. And if they're not matching up, uh, why not? The other aspect of underrepresentation, and it's not the main focus of, our, of the call, but I think we have to look at it, is um, the inclusivity of who is doing the research. So we have just a couple of questions in our um, uh, questionnaire that do ask some a couple of basic points. Uh, about that. Not a lot because um, we just can't do everything in the questionnaire um, and my own association German studies is uh, well with women in German studies who actually led it um, has just completed quite a complex uh, survey of researchers from an EDI perspective and that was really complicated. We just can't replicate that sort of nationwide to get that fine-grained data but we do ask a bit about that and that will go into our report as well. Okay, well, thank you very much. I know we've only scratched the surface, but um, we have an idea what you're doing. And um, it's very clear that you you have a very, very clear plan. So that's, that's really brilliant. Thank you very much for that. Good morning, everyone. I'm Li Wei. I'm the director and dean of the IOE, UCL's Faculty of Education and Society. I'm here uh, also as a co-director of uh, Bilingual Matters London branch to host this uh, session. Monday this week, the International Mother Language Day, the day was created by UNESCO to promote multilingualism and linguistic and cultural diversity across the world. Now, our session today is to explore the transformative effects that educators, scholars, and language learners can experience when all become aware of the persuasiveness of multilingualism and the possibilities that come with allowing everyone involved in, in language learning to uh, mobilize and expand their linguistic repertoires in all their complexity and fluidity. We want to focus in particular on the role of the so-called community languages, especially those of minoritized communities. I've made the point many times elsewhere, and I want to make it again here, that all minority languages are majority languages 
somewhere in the world. It's a matter of perspective. Many of the so-called community languages in Britain are major national and international languages of the world. We need to change and broaden our perspectives in modern language research and in modern language education. As I say, this uh, session is led by colleagues of the Bilingualism Matters London branch, and I'm delighted to have three speakers, Petros Karasaris, uh, who's uh, from uh, University of West Westminster and also a co-director of Bilingualism Matters London, Kathleen McCarthy uh, from Queen Mary University of London, and Joanna McPaik from Strathclyde University. They will introduce themselves uh, more when they speak. So I'm uh, handing over to Petros to start the presentation. Thank you, Li Wei, and hello, everyone, and welcome to um, this session um, from the London branch of Bilingualism Matters. Um, I don't want to say much about myself. My name is Petros Kratares. I'm the uh, Senior Lecturer in English Language and Linguistics at uh, the University of Westminster in the School of Humanities. And um, I'm going to be um, kickstarting this session on um, decentering and decolonizing multi-languages research from um, the perspective of um, so-called community, um, community languages. So I, I thought it'd be useful at the beginning of this session um, to offer some more general um, uh, discussion about what decolonization and decentering might mean in the context of language teaching, language research, and language pedagogy more generally. So Maybelline, Maybelline and Turner in their recent and very highly recommended uh, book on migration studies and colonialism, um, write that decolonization essentially consists of three, um, three endeavors. Uh, the first of those is a uh, renewed questioning or uncovering of the colonial origins of some of the core concepts of the humanities and social sciences. So the idea here is that a lot of the research uh, that is done, a lot of the research that we do um, is based on concepts that trace their origin to um, uh, colonization and some ideological uh, transformations that took place during and after colonization. There is also a focus on uh, the Eurocentrism that is inherent to much research, teaching, and ways of doing and understanding things that needs to be. Um, reconsidered and decentered. And also decolonization involves critiquing the ways in which research and teaching practices reproduce hierarchies and power relations. And this is central um, in terms of languages, uh, because as we'll see, um, hierarchies, linguistic hierarchies, and are, very, are still very well widespread and uh, widely accepted, even in circles where we wouldn't expect these hierarchies uh, to have any, any foothold. So according to the, uh, this perspective, uh, colon uh, colonialism um, introduced hierarchies of humanity. This is um, the process whereby social, cultural, and other human differences uh, were codified into hierarchies that connote superiority and inferiority. Now, Maybelline and Turner are very careful to, um, to clarify that ideas of otherness, uh, ideas of strangeness existed before colonial times. But what colonialism did was codify those, uh, those differences and those ideas of otherness into hierarchies that were later uh, viewed and came to be treated as natural, uh, scientific, and matter of fact. And this holds true in terms of a lot of the ideas and ideologies around uh, languages. So when we move, we try to apply these notions to our uh, field of language studies and linguistics. Um, a very recent uh, edited volume by um, Dermert and Storch on colonial and decolonial linguistics suggests that languages are largely viewed through a Eurocentric lens as bounded, um, structured, recordable, codifiable, tangible, controllable, and improvable. It's the idea that languages are objects with uh, very discrete boundaries that we can study, record, um, 
and improve as as learners. So it's basically the the the, the problem here is this idea of boundedness that is very uh, deeply rooted in uh, in much linguistics and language thought, but which is in reality and on the ground, as Li Wei and others have showed. Uh, challenged on an everyday basis by the actual linguistic practices of multilingual speakers. So hierarchies of language might take a form uh, like this, so whereby uh, separate and bounded and uh, independent so-called languages uh, are ranked. Um, so for example, language A might be considered more valued, more important, might carry more prestige than language B. And uh, languages, language A, are, um, is, uh, are, these are typically the languages of, of colonizers, so the so-called powerful languages, English, French, uh, Spanish, German, Italian, and also languages of colonizers in other parts of the world. Uh, languages of the colonized, of uh, people who are colonized, um, tend to be viewed as uh, lesser in importance. And in the context in which we're discussing today, um, this is reflected in labeling uh, languages using words like modern languages, foreign languages on the one hand, and uh, community or heritage languages or migrant languages or home languages on, uh, on the other. And the same hierarchies apply also to um, varieties um, that may not be viewed by people as separate languages, um, so uh, geographical varieties, dialects, accents, um, some of which are more important than others, so typically standardized varieties are given the status of languages, whereas non-standardized varieties are described in terms of um, words like dialect, slang, broken, uh, patois. So it is exactly these hierarchies of um, of language that we need to start uh, attacking uh, in our field uh, because they have, they essentially represent um, differential power relations between, uh, between speakers. So speakers of uh, um, uh, languages and varieties that are high in hierarchies um, are, are privileged compared to speakers of languages that are lower in the hierarchy. Uh, so the aim as um, uh, Macedo and others uh, in recent work have, um, have talked about is essentially democratizing uh, language research and language pedagogies by essentially recognizing that people that speak are speakers of mixed and blended repertoires, they are practitioners of linguistic fluidity and survival in a world that is never monolingual. Uh, so a number of linguistic practices that reflect uh, this um, uh, this dynamic, fluid, and complex uh, nature of languaging, such as translanguaging and other practices, tend to be subordinated in, in language pedagogies. So what we need to, um, uh, to start thinking about is uh, first becoming aware of the privileged dominance and inherent or so-called inherent superiority of colonial standardized languages. And we need as um, language teachers, language learners, and language researchers to unleash the language potential with which humans are all endowed in order to recreate um, their own ways of speaking that correspond to resisting and rejecting colonial subjugation in language teaching and other uh, language related contexts. Uh, so I wanted to share this um, very powerful um, extract from um, some of my own research on uh, Cypriot Greek in, in London's Greek Cypriot diaspora. Um, uh, this is an extra from an interview with um, a woman um, that I've named Skevi. Uh, Skevi was 36 years old um, at the time when she uh, she relayed this story to me, and in this extract, she remembers um, something that happened to her when she was six, and she started attending uh, Greek complementary school in North London. Uh, at the time, uh, Skevi had uh, mostly uh, Cypriot Greek varieties in her repertoire, and also English, having been born in, in London. So in this extract, she remembers how um, she arrived late for class one day, and as soon as she walked into the classroom, uh, there was no chair for her, for her to sit. And um, she asked for a chair, 
Um, but instead of the standard root word for chair, she used the separate word for chair. So instead of saying karekla, which is the standard root word, she said uh, tsaera. So tsaera and chair are actually cognates from the medieval French word for chair. That's, an, uh, that's for the French uh, colleagues in the audience. Uh, so what's interesting here is that um, we have a six-year-old child arriving at Greek school, having told that she's there to practice and learn more about the language of her family, which is Greek. And uh, she walks into a classroom where she expects to find other Greek-speaking people, and she draws on her Greek repertoire without knowing that the word that she has for chair is not accepted by the teacher. The teacher pretended uh, to not understand uh, what the what Skeddy was asking for. Um, and then when she was faced with this, um, with this reaction, uh, Skeddy drew on the other language that she had in her repertoire, which was English. So she said, what is that chair in English? So what do we have here? We have here the, uh, the expectation from the teacher that Skevi will have competences in the standardized variety of Greek, the one that is higher in the hierarchy, but the one that she doesn't have in her repertoire. So when she can't communicate using the variety that she does have in her repertoire, she draws on English, which in this sense, uh, the teacher basically undermined her own uh, aims, because the aims of teaching in complementary school is to develop competences in the home language or the standardized variety of the home language. But what was most uh, was more powerful for me was this sort of uh, reflection, self-reflection that Skevi said that when it was at this point that she realized that the Cypriot Greek that she knew and had learned was so-called heavy. Cypriot, and she realized at the age of six that she didn't speak correctly, that she spoke in a mistaken way. So we see here the, the, the transplantation of um, linguistic hierarchies in a diasporic setting uh, where uh, multilingualism is uh, the norm and is to be celebrated, but even within such contexts that um, aim to fight uh, linguistic assimilation and homogenization, will still find uh, linguistic hierarchies uh, being uh, very, having an impact on, on um, learners as young as six. So um, it was based on this, another research that a number of colleagues and I in 2020 suggested in a, um, in a policy paper that speakers of non-standardized and non-stigmatized linguistic varieties bring into the learning process alternative forms of linguistic and semiotic capital, voices and knowledges produced outside hegemonic paradigms. And it is these voices and knowledges that must be acknowledged, valorized, mobilized and integrated into pedagogical policy and practice. Uh, because in this way, uh, um, we can foster the critical literacy of, um, of pupils uh, and also the critical language awareness. We can strengthen the confidence and increase the sense of ownership in their own language learning. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. That's all from me. And I'm looking forward to the discussion after my colleagues' contributions as well. Thank you so much. Thanks, Petros. I'll just share my screen. All good? Okay. Yes. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay, so I'm um I'm coming at this from um the early early years perspective. Uh, I, as um, introduced by Li Wei, I'm in the Department of Linguistics, so I'm a senior lecturer in linguistics, and I'm also part of the Bilingualism Matters London branch. Um, I primarily work in the early years in inner in a city uh, diaspora communities. So I'm not a, a modern languages, uh, languages uh, uh, per se person, uh, but I come at this from a child language acquisition perspective. So I primarily work on developmental milestones of multilingual children who go up in diaspora communities. And often these children are sequential bilinguals or new arrival children, the sort of children that um, Petros was just talking about there in his example of the six-year-old child. 
And these languages, the home languages, uh, these children's first language is often hugely understudied. So one of the things we have to do as researchers is um, firstly understand that language and the structure of that language before we start um, trying to understand the typical development in children growing up in such environments. And this work that we do has implications for atypical development too. And to get at that, it's really, really crucial to understand the children's environment. That's the languages in their lives, the patterns of language use and the impact of their language use. And this is both from the community perspective, but also the individual identity of these children. Now, today I'm going to be focusing on that aspect, the aspect of the environment that these children are, are in, the languages in their lives. So just to give you a bit about the context, I primarily work with primary school age children from London communities. And one of the main um, communities we've worked with so far are the London uh, Bangladeshi community and the schools we work with, and that's mainly in East London, but also in the London borough of Camden as well. We, uh, these children have, um, uh, these schools have around 75% plus uh, uh, bang children who are Bangladeshi heritage. So just echoing what uh, Li Wei said at the start, these are uh, classed as um, children, additional languages, community languages, minority languages, but they really are dominant languages, especially in communities like in East London. Now, just to second what Petros said, um, many of these children don't speak the standard variety. They speak Sileti, not standard Bengali. And this is reflecting the local community, but also reflecting the diaspora community within the UK and also other, other countries too. So today I'm going to focus on um, the London Bangladeshi, um, London Bangladeshi community. So for these children, multilingualism and of course everything that comes with it starts really early. And unfortunately, early on, these hierarchical distinctions that are made between the children's first language and the modern languages that are taught in school starts early. So in terms of their first language, uh, they, this is presented to the children in the sort of clubs that Petros just spoke about, so community language clubs. These are often run after school. It, it would take the initiative of, of a caregiver to sign up or they're run in community centres. Um, in some schools that we've worked in, um, schools are lucky to have a lunchtime provision, a funded lunchtime provision. So lunchtime Bangla, where the caregivers sign up and the children can attend these sessions during their lunch break. In contrast, modern languages have been integrated into the curriculum. So many of the schools we work with, the children start to learn Spanish uh, really early on. And the way they, they integrate this is, 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 is really wonderful to see. Um, lots of engaging, um, age appropriate ways to teach, uh, teach these languages. At the same time, I want to point out that there is some recognition of the children's home languages, but this is often through, um, you know, simple phrases, uh, hello, goodbye, um, what, how do you say hello in your, in your home, in your mother tongue? And of course, they, um, especially in inner cities like London, they celebrate the children's traditional uh, traditions and also religious events. But again, often this is not, this just does not reflect the languages that are spoken in home, and we still see um, it primarily being in the standard variety. So in the case in our work, it's the standard Bengali versus Saleti. Now, one thing, uh, unfortunately, with the, the provision that did exist uh, for the children's first language, unfortunately, at least in East London, there's been huge government cuts uh, uh, for community language for that community language provision. So uh, in the schools that we work with, the uh, lunchtime language classes um, have been cut, the schools don't have that funding and the community centres likewise just don't have the funding to provide that service for the children. And yet again, unfortunately, and this has been the case uh, for, you know, we have some, um, some members of the community that uh, have grown up in the community and they recall when they were attending these community language clubs that it, just like a Petros example that it was always in standard Bengali and they realized wait that this isn't the this isn't the language I learn at home and I've observed um, through uh, my research uh, uh, um, the language teachers quite explicitly saying that children should be learning standard Bengali because Sileti is not a real language. Um, well, whilst we're at this point, I want to point out that in Sileti, at least in the London community, is um, is a primarily an oral language. Um, there is the the uh, the written form of the language, but that's currently being revived and. Um, 
uh, and uh, died out around mid 20th century. But it's being revived by wonderful groups like the Saleti, uh, so, uh, the SOAS uh, Saleti Language Project. Now, what does this result in uh, from a childhood experience perspective? Now, there's a failure to recognize and value the children's first language. And this has quite strong implications for the development of identity and motivation to maintain their first language. Now, we've seen that in our research. We've seen that in our research where we're, we're really documenting and detailing their language environment and then looking at their developmental milestones. Um, and this only fuels the decline of the use of the children's first language. And what we've seen quite strongly, and this is um, what I'll talk about in a moment when I focus on a specific project, is it creates a gap between generations within the community. And this has um, long lasting impacts that uh, often people don't necessarily think about. So isolation of elders in the community who would primarily speak the first language, um, whereas their grandchildren um, will, will primarily speak English, for example, or any other language that learning in school. And of course, this continues to fuel any existing hierarchical attitudes um, towards languages. So the status of, uh, of, of languages, say, between the standard variety and the non-standard variety. Whilst we're on that point, although we're talking about childhood experience here in East London at Queen Mary University, we have a lot of local students who grew up in East London. They're of Bangladeshi heritage themselves. And when I present Saleti in our classroom and we're talking about language acquisition or phonetics or phonology, and I ask them which language they speak at home, they have often explicitly said that I, I speak, I speak Bengali, but it's not it's not the real standard Bengali. You know, they're almost ashamed to to um, to admit it. And then when they see us researching Saleti, um, it totally changes their attitudes towards that. So, in terms of implication for early education. Um, there is a lack of awareness of the children's first language, the structure of the children's first language, so what they're bringing to school and their foundations. The schools are amazing at supporting the children they have, um, in terms of when they first start school, so they often have teaching assistants that speak Saleti, but the more broader awareness of the children's home language environment uh, doesn't really exist. So that's one of the aims of the research that we do. And meanwhile, we have linguists like myself um, and uh, my colleagues at Queen Mary that continue to research and document these understudied languages. And that's including, uh, in this case, the SOAS Saleti project. So there's a quite a big gap between, uh, between these areas. Now, today I want to just quickly um, go over a project that we're doing that aims to bridge that gap, where we're bringing home into school. Now, we work with children and their community to raise awareness on this issue. And the, the uh, project is called Stories from Home. And what we've been doing is running workshops in schools and with COVID, uh, running them online. And this project has been going on since uh, around about 2018. And we've been bringing first generation family members into school. And these first generation family members are often grandparents and they often speak little English. And we ask the grandparents to share stories, share stories that they feel are important to them in terms of their identity, their uh, family history, um, and also uh, history um, related to Bangladesh, share these stories with their grandchildren. And parents then act as language facilitators if needed. And children then retell the story in English or in Saleti and with the help of their own illustrations. And we've captured these stories on film. So first of all, I'd like to just show you one of these films uh, that we've produced with the families and the, and the school. So um, at this point, if it freezes, uh, I want you to just, uh, Petros, turn your microphone on and let me know. Hey. Bobo, when did you come to London? আমি যখন আমার ফ্যামিলি তো ইয়াইছি তখন আমার যে কষ্ট লাগছে আমি দিন রাত খানতাম বাংলাদেশ লাগি when my mom left bangladesh she felt sad and scared she was leaving all her family জুনেরা আমি আশা শুনে আমি খুব অসুস্থ ছিলাম দুর্বল আমি যখন লন্ডন এয়ারপোর্ট আসলাম তখন লন্ডন এয়ারপোর্ট আর ওর ডাক্তারে চেক আপ করিয়া আমার হসপিটাল পাঠাই দিছে on the journey she is feeling really ill when she arrived in london the doctors at the airport rushed her to hospital he was really scared 
She didn't know what was happening and she couldn't speak English. I was <laughs> like, 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 I was 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 like, he <laughs> That was my papa's first time in London, but now all her family are here. Her children, her grandchildren, and her great-grandchildren. Thanks. My computer sounds like it's about to take off. <laughs> but hopefully you were able to hear that properly. So this is, um, so as you would have seen there, the, the grandparents are telling a story uh, about their, their, um, their, their migration to, to the UK. And the children, many of these stories that were shared, uh, this was the first time the children had, had heard about these stories. And also many, for many of the grandparents, it was the first time they'd been in school. Um, and uh, and this uh, and for not only for for the the children themselves, but it was very important for the schools also uh, to see uh, and to 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 observe the the um, the environment that the children have at home. Now, just um, what we're doing now is we're expanding to other communities um, in London, and we're working with library services to provide tools for the school so they can carry out these types of workshops with family members, bring the home language, bring the children's first language and dominant language into the school and raise awareness both with the children and the teachers and other members of the community. Now, before I finish up and pass on to Joanna, I just want to share some of the feedback that we've received uh, from the parents, uh, the schools and the children. Um, so uh, one of the parents, uh, uh, stated that without knowledge, without knowledge and respect, that this knowledge and respect, history and understanding and self-respect and identity is lost. And it's so crucial for children to take pride in their mother tongue. Recognition and pride of owning their language, to understand and appreciate the struggle and journey from which we got here. So with these languages comes a whole area of history that is simply uh, lost if it's not recognized, especially when we have when we're working with grandparents who often are hold a key uh, to a wealth of knowledge through language. And to maintain a sense of pride and connection with their ancestral heritage and to foster intergenerational relationships. We're also working with, um, with uh, we're collaborating with um, uh, researchers and practitioners who work in mental health, mental health for older, uh, older adults in the community and ensuring they have access to services, but also communication with their, with their other family members. The schools, so we work very closely with SENCOs, primarily through um, the research and child language development, but they've um, often said, and this, uh, this uh, comment from one of our SENCOs reflects the, the, um, the feedback we've received, the resources, so the workshop materials are extremely useful facil for facilitating discussions with our children and families around heritage, language and culture. And they've used these films in assembly. So this is often for the first time, you know, seeing a film in an assembly is just huge when you're six, right? <laughs> it's, it's such a big thing. These children only ever hear, you know, English or other, other modern languages in the school. So it really, you know, these children are just, some of them were even giggling at the beginning. I went to one of these screenings and they were like, oh, my, my, my granny, you know, my granny, my dada speaks this language. Um, but it's really, really huge and it's so important for their identity. And for children, as, the, as this Senko said here, for the children to feel proud of their linguistic and cultural background and experiences. 
And the children, my dada, which um, is a grandmother in Bangla, if my dada speak, talks in Bangla, if I don't, I don't speak to her. And I enjoy learning about Bangla and learning about Bangladesh. You know, that connects the two. And not only are they learning about their heritage language, but they're learning about the roots um, and, uh, and their, own, um, their own heritage. So thank you for listening. And um, thanks to all of our wonderful collaborators and our, um, our partners. I want to um, say a particular thanks to uh, Dr. Mahira Ruby. Um, she's uh, blooming parenting, but also an academic. Nurul Islam, he's the co-founder of the Myland Community Project, uh, Lindsay Knight. Uh, he's the, the, um, the excellent knowledge and uh, creative skills behind those films. And of course, the wonderful families, children and schools that we work with and continue to work with. Thank you. And um, I look forward to a discussion with you after Joanna's talk. Thanks. Thank you very much. Over to you, uh, Joanna. Okay. Um, I'm just going to try and share my screen with you. Thank you. Thank you, Li Wei. Thank you um, to uh, Bilingual Ma Bilingualism Matters um, London for inviting me to, to talk to you today and to everybody in the audience for coming along. Um, my name is uh, Joanna McPeak. Um, I'm uh, a lecturer at the School of Education at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. Um, and I'm a teacher educator who has worked with teachers of modern languages, community languages, English as additional language, and indeed teachers working in Gaelic medium education over the course of my career in Scotland and elsewhere. But my presentation today is about recent work in Scotland um, that I'm conducting with three other colleagues concerning primary language provision, particularly a development that we're calling lang local language encounters, where schools explore ways of teaching languages already uh, in use in the school and in the local community, um, developing opportunities for co-teaching and co-learning languages, which children have already encountered and have opportunities to use now in their everyday lives. So my, my um, slides are not moving on for some reason. They did. Okay, um, so this is an approach which is providing opportunities to rethink um, the purposes and practices of primary language provision. And the key points to come out of this presentation are firstly that this approach offers opportunities for decolonization that includes all pupils, whether or not they're already users of the local languages in question. Um, and it enables them all to share and explore the linguistic and cultural environment local to their school and associated communities. Secondly, a significant pedagogical advantage of this approach is that it builds on primary teachers' existing strengths as people who are committed to holistic, inclusive and child-centred ecologies of learning. And it incorporates interdisciplinarity, which is a key feature of Scotland's Curriculum for Excellence, promoting collaborative and sustainable practices. Thirdly, this approach has revealed the transformational power of local language encounters. Learner identities change and develop so that all pupils en envisage themselves as emergent bilinguals. Um, it challenges conventional thinking about the purposes of language learning at this early stage, bringing in the perspectives of different stakeholders, the children themselves, their parents, the communities associated with the school, and of course the teachers and the educational authorities. And looking at language learning from all these different perspectives raises challenging questions about what constitutes effective language learning. So the process of working together and engaging in dialogue in this way has the potential to strengthen community languages within, sorry, community relationships within and beyond the classroom. I don't know why it won't move on. I've been having problems with it. I don't know whether you are in this, uh, slide mode. I think you probably, if you can change to a slide mode. If I go to, I'm really sorry about this. If I go to slide mode, I think you'll see a very strange screen, but I'll try. Oh. How's that? Yes, that's fine. 
Okay, that's yeah. good. Thank you. Thank you. That's Lee. good. Yeah. <laughs> um, so our starting point for this work has been Alison Phipps's uh, work on decolonization uh, of multilingualism and her invitation in that book to think of, to rethink our ideas about language learning. Um, and she asks two very deceptively simple questions. Who do we want to talk to and how will we learn? And in this presentation, I'm going to suggest that largely unchallenged assumptions about the languages to be learned in schools in Scotland and more generally across the UK have very much limited our debate about who we want to talk to and by extension, how we want to learn. Over the course of my life as a language learner and a language teacher, rationales for learning modern or foreign languages have shifted from accessing high culture to economic benefits to mutual tolerance and understanding across Europe. But the languages that we studied have remained the same, principally French, German, and Spanish. And pedagogies have moved on from the remnants of the grammar translation method that I encountered when I first started language learning at school to what we broadly call communicative language teaching. But they've nevertheless assumed highly trained specialist teachers with a detailed understanding of what we might call the technical aspects of second language acquisition. The introduction of primary language provision has troubled this consensus because most primary teachers are not highly trained specialists. But despite the problems that this has created, we've not really changed our ideas about teaching approaches. FIPS not only questions the, what, like, which languages we need and what we need them for, but also how we'll learn them and argues that the technicist approach is no longer viable. Co-teaching and co-learning have greater potential. And these are the approaches which perhaps by chance have emerged in recent years in some Scottish primary schools. Very briefly, for those not familiar with primary languages policy in Scotland, which is called one plus two, schools are expected to introduce one additional language known as the L2 from the start of the primary phase and another language known as the L3 from age nine. The focus of implementation from 2012, when 1 plus 2 was introduced, has been on achieving the early start for L2 and ensuring continuity and progression across the primary phase and into the secondary phase. So L2 provision looks quite similar to primary language provision in many other contexts um, as it has traditionally evolved. But the possibilities presented by L3, to which less attention has been paid until recently, have revealed this to constitute a radical space where we can think differently about those who we want to talk to and how we want to learn. As it's evolved away from a st paper statement of intent in 2012 to full implementation at present, the L3 radical space is providing opportunities to move away from conceptual, co conventional conceptions of foreign language learning. And using FIPS questions, we might say that these conceptualizations assumed that primary, language, primary pupils were learning languages such as French and German, because one day they might have the opportunity to travel to these countries perhaps to work there or to work with people who speak these languages. And therefore pedagogy is focused on learning phrases and structures that might be useful to children in the future when they might have opportunities to do this. But as the snatches of conversation that I've re reproduced here indicate, um, and they come from studies that I conducted perhaps 20 years ago, and perhaps were not even part of the main data sets, but just things that have stayed with me, um, these um, little conversations reveal, I think, huge gaps between children's comprehension of the language learning task and adults' assumptions about its value. In contrast, if we consider the languages to be offered in the primary school as local languages, the languages that are already in use among some of the children in the classroom or in the school or in the community, then they're no longer something exotic, something that in some unimaginable future we might find a use for but something that we can make use of right now in lots of different ways. And these are some of the comments in the bubbles here from participants in three investigations of early L3 initiatives that my colleagues conducted. So David Roxborough studied the teaching of Chinese in primary schools, including a focus on a school where children were given extensive opportunities to use their Mandarin in the local area, both with local residents and with Chinese tourists, for whom they provided information about local history and attractions in interdisciplinary projects which integrated their learning of Mandarin with history, drama, music, graphic design and technology. 
Lorna Anderson researched a local authority project to involve parents in L3 teaching with spectacular results showing huge enthusiasm for language learning among pupils, in-depth discussions among teachers about the purposes and methods of language teaching, really questioning what they had um, assumed all along to be the norm here, and also the creation of new relationships amongst parents from different um, linguistic and cultural backgrounds, led by the children who had become so enthusiastic that they would not accept uh, the notion, for example, that African food uh, is not something that white children are likely to eat. Malika Pedley's uh, research focused on the use of the mother tongue, other tongue competition, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, um, as an L3 project in, um, a, again, a number of schools in a particular local authority. And here the pupils um, taught the different languages that they already knew to their peers and to teachers through a collaborative engagement on the poetry writing task. And this transformed ideas about their own identities, um, enabling everyone to realize that they're all bilingual or can be bilingual, and also uh, about ideas about creativity across languages as well. I don't have time to go into these projects in detail, um, but I want to identify um, really four emerging issues um, that relate to pedagogy and policy at this point. Um, and so these are these questions here. Um, is the concept of a local language a useful one for primary schools? How might we define it? How can teachers teach languages of which they have little or no knowledge? That's a major challenge for the teachers. What challenges or concerns are raised if we propose a shift to the teaching of local languages as L3, uh, which, which would be a very different from the way that we're teaching the L2, and what possibilities are opened up? So defining local languages, um, there's a lot to say about that, but I'm only going to give very brief responses to these questions here. We, the researchers, believe that the concept of local languages, the languages of family, friends and neighbours, has much to recommend it in the context of the philosophy and the values of Scottish education and given growing linguistic diversity in Scotland as elsewhere, uh, give, which means that any language that, that is identifiable in the world is potentially a local language in Scotland. It depends on the schools and their communities which languages they might pick. We are identifying new pedagogies, we, and we identify that radical new pedagogies are needed, but these can build on the existing strengths of Scottish primary teachers, particularly in uh, relation to interdisciplinary learning, which is something teachers have been charged to do recently and which they are um, engaging in very extensively. Um, and this, this picture shows an example from the Chinese project where you can see the range of different things that children uh, did there. Um, co-learning and co-teaching are challenges in relation to the approaches that have been conventionally adopted, but the three projects identified huge potential and huge benefits. So even though there's a lot of work to be done in developing that area, we can already see that it's worth embarking on that. There are counter arguments to um, our model of L3 as we're proposing it here. Contemplating making these changes is challenging for teachers and education authorities. But I think that given the, con the long-standing concerns that we've had about the sustainable, about conventional modern languages provision in Scottish schools as elsewhere, um, this is a good time to debate some of the alternatives and see what they might offer. And so these arguments, which I set out at the beginning of the presentation, are, I think, some of the key reasons for taking that debate forward. So thank you for listening. These are the references that I briefly um, uh, showed in the earlier slides. I'm just leaving them here for a moment so that they're recorded. But if anybody wants to contact me about any of these um, uh, issues, please do so. My email is there. Thank you for listening. And I'm also looking very much forward to the debate. Thank you very much, Joanna, and thank you to Kathleen and uh, uh, Petros as well. Uh, so we have uh, a time for some uh, comments and questions um, from uh, the audience. Please do uh, either uh, speak up if um, you can or uh, send in your questions uh, through the chat. Yes, please, go ahead. Uh, 
Sorry. Yeah, uh, hi, I'm Michelle Vincent and I'm a lecturer in Modern Languages at the University of Glasgow. And I have a question for Kathleen McCarthy. So thank you very much, uh, everybody, for the great presentations, first of all. Um, and I wanted to see with the project that you did, um, how does it work if you have, which was a great project, how does it work if you have uh, a classroom with a, you know, like half of, of the children would be from, you know, uh, diverse background and the other half would be, you know, I mean, Scotland, they would just uh, fully pull, pull Scottish, like how would you include everybody? Is that something done in the classroom or is it, you know, a project set outside of the classroom with different people? Thanks, Michelle. That's a really good question. Um, so this particular project uh, so far, um, we've run sessions outside of the classroom and it's the materials then that are developed from our workshop that go into the classroom and can go. It, you, it, the idea, so, so just to explain how we did this, we brought parents into and grandparents into um, a, a session uh, that was run in the school, but outside of the classroom time. So grandparents and grandchildren were taking part in the workshop. It's very different in this community because uh, really, I mean, 75% is one of our lower, lower percentages, right? So we've got we're basically a classroom that's, you know, 98% Bangladeshi heritage. Of course, I completely understand this doesn't necessarily reflect every other classroom in the UK, even if you're in a, a big city like Glasgow. Um, so what we have also been doing is we're expanding to communities outside of London, like in places like Luton, where you'd have a lot of new arrival families as well. But the classroom is, or in Kent, for example, classrooms are very mixed. And the idea would be that um, you could still run these sessions, um, but you would have like little clusters of languages. Um, so the families are sitting together. The key thing that's needed really is the grandparents there um, and the parents uh, to help facilitate that conversation if the children's proficiency in their first language isn't isn't good enough to to retell the story completely. Um, so I, I, we can we are starting to develop it, like I said, to uh, to communities. But in in London, we first started off. It, this stems out of our research, and my research is mainly in East London, and so um, or and we just have communities where there is a dominant dominant language. Um, but I can certainly, what we're doing is developing materials so it allows us to, to work with a more diverse classroom. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Uh, in the chat, uh, Bansi Wall uh, raised a really important uh, issue of uh, British Sign Language. Uh, of course, uh, it's gaining legal status as well. So, uh, you know, it's a very important community language uh, in the British uh, context. Um, I think we absolutely need to bring that into the uh, discussion. Yeah, that's, uh, thank you for raising that. Um, M seems, I don't know the, <laughs> the actual name, uh, made a comment about the lack of accreditation uh, for some of the languages. That's a real challenge. That's absolutely something that we have to campaign for. Um, uh, but also, you know, recognizing that higher education institutions have a, a role to play in uh, urging um, uh, examination uh, boards to uh, recognize uh, the importance of uh, community languages. So we have a few hands up. Um, Helena? Uh, hi, hello. Name, right? yeah. Uh, yeah, Helena Chalic uh, from uh, uh, UCL. So I have, I have a question for Petros, um, actually. Um, so about this understanding of languages as bound identities that we uh, encounter as well in, in our language teaching quite a lot and in teaching of um, language contact or minority languages as well. Um, so um, what do you think, what is your opinion, to, to what extent um, this is actually trans transmitted, this understanding by teacher, teachers in, in actual uh, language classes and to what extent um, the sort of uh, the, the teacher education plays role here and um, also, uh, and this, this uh, in, in some institutional settings, this idea, I mean, I think that kind of refers to your, uh, to the example that you uh, have given as well, the, um, that it is enough to be a native, the so-called native speaker of a language uh, in order to be able to teach the language. 
Uh, that's one question. And the other question is to do with the, um, the um, to what extent actually the institutional div divisions and the way we name our uh, language departments contributes to uh, the replication of these hierarchies of, of languages. Uh, for instance, I work at UCL at two departments at the School of Slavonic and East European Studies where I teach Serbo-Croatian. So the school is called the School of Slavonic um, uh, Studies, but we teach languages which are not Slavonic as well, so Finnish, Hungarian, and Romanian. Uh, I also teach at a uh, school of the so-called European Languages and Cultures um, at, at UCL, uh, where what we teach here, where I teach Swedish, and um, uh, where what we teach, um, the languages that we teach are called, called uh, modern languages, whereas the languages that we teach at, at School of Slavonic and East European Studies are called the East European languages. So I'm just, uh, and then um, uh, next to us, we have SOAS as well at UCL, yeah. so the School of African, uh, Oriental and African um, uh, Studies. So yeah, to what extent, that, that's my question, to what extent the way we name uh, our language departments um, contributes to this replication of hierarchies of languages? Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Uh, it's it's good to see you again. I, I definitely I start from the, the last question because uh, um, I think institutions have a great role to play in in the framing and reproduction of of hierarchies and and labels. Um, I, I I agree that part of this process would be to think again as well of the you know the institutional names, um, everything that sort of gives. Um, prestige, credit, power, and legibility to particular ideological uh, content in terms of those, those labels. In, um, I was recently asked to write a chapter about European immigrant languages in the UK. And I, I asked myself, and I asked in the chapter, why would uh, Bengali and select not be considered to be European languages? Mm. If they are spoken in Europe, by generations of speakers who are born in Europe um, and are citizens of European countries if we want to go by a political or geographical label. So how do we define European languages or any other, or East European or Central or Western or, or, or whatever? So definitely uh, I am pro the direction of doing away with all these labels and calling them languages, which is what they, they are. And we know that labels create problems as well in other domains. So institutional, institutions should also be doing uh, this as well, in my, my view. In terms of the question of the native language uh, teachers, um, I was taught English entirely by non-native speakers of the language and French as well, and Italian when I was living in, in Greece. So I, I, and quite anecdotally, for a very brief period of time, we had a native British English speaker as a teacher, and she was the least popular teacher in, in the language school that I was learning English in. Um, it's, it's a different type, uh, my experience is a different type of report with, uh, with the students if, um, uh, if, there's a different, like there's shared common social cultural background. So I'm, I, I don't consider native speakers to be the best teachers of the, of the languages. Um, and, it, and yes, I, a lot of these ideas about discrete languages being discrete and bounded are of course reproduced through education. Uh, and what is interesting for, for me and Alexander, who's also present and we did this research in, in complementary schools, is how teachers do produce those labels, but at the same time in their practices, they, they are what I mentioned before, very dynamic users of the four repertoires that they have at their disposal. But when it comes to teaching, it's always hierarchies and, and binaries. So this is, uh, this, this is Greek, this is Cypriot, this is English, you can't, you can't mix them. And then they go on mixing them in talking to the students and describing a particular task and instructing students how to learn those bounded uh, languages. Um, so I, I think it's interesting to make people aware and of course introduce in pedagogies um, more training into social linguistics and from a linguistic repertoire perspective 
to show in reality what people do and enable them and empower them to do more and achieve more with their repertoires. Um, but, but I agree that those labels are very hard to um, um, to deconstruct because they, they have very deep roots and people like to think in terms of them. And, it's, and also linguists are not entirely innocent in using those labels mm. to describe um, uh, linguistic resources and linguistic systems. Mm. Thanks very much, Pedro. Uh, uh, question from Sarah, Sarah O'Neill. Um, hello, I hope you can hear me at least and perhaps see me. I want to say thank you to Petros, Kathleen and Joanna. I'm a PhD student at Queen's University. And my question is for Joanna in the Scottish context. And I'm interested in how we build sustainability into the learning of L3, how we really embed that in the curriculum so that the language experiences that children make are ongoing and part of their primary experience, not just one off workshops or one off experiences. So I'm wondering when we're dependent on workshops and project based approaches on parents, how that can be integrated and embedded in the curriculum in a way that these children make ongoing positive language learning experiences with the L3. Um, thank you. That's a, that's a great question. And I think that there is a, a variety of ways of answering it. Um, not all of these project, not all of the examples I gave you were project based. They may have sounded as if they were, but um, some of them were three years of sustained activity in themselves. So, um, in fact, in some schools, um, that way of working has become part of it. And I think it's the interdisciplinarity um, that gives people the opportunity to build things into uh, the mainstream curriculum um, in fluid, but um, concentrated ways so that um, particularly in thinking about the Chinese uh, teaching those were long running projects which uh, inter intersected with the teaching of history for example um, and local history and things like that so I think that's one way of thinking about it but another way of thinking about it for me is that um, I think all of these very successful projects raised major questions about what we think um, the purpose of that language learning is and in asking those questions what we think continuity and progression means in this context um, and I think there's a big difference between the, what I'd see as the kind of standard or conventional ways of thinking about that um, you know you learn 10, 10 words vocabulary then you learn 100 words of vocabulary then you can do the past tense um, then you can do some little dialogues uh, in which you understand the questions and can provide the right kinds of answers those are what I would see as kind of fairly standard primary language learning exercises um, but to me there's a big question about how much children retain of that um, once they move on to secondary school um, in any case um, but I think what we find with these projects is that they the children retained all sorts of interesting things about these languages which are to do with how the languages are connected to the culture um, because they're local languages for example some children learned to cook african food using ingredients from an african shop which was on their doorstep but they'd never been into it um, and they continued cooking those foods they continued going into those shops and they continued talking to the people in those shops in the in the shona that they had learned uh, because they were so enthusiastic about it and for me um, I think that shows um, a very different kind of model of um, sustainable development and sustainability from the one that we've typically thought about where we um, isolate language learning as a school subject um, and say, oh, it will be useful for you later on. You just have to trust us that one day you too can go to Germany and speak German because there's nobody around here who speaks German or appears to be nobody around here who speaks German at the moment. So um, I think there are conventional uh, forms of sustainability, but I think we also have to think about what do we think sustainability means in the primary context. Uh, Joanna, uh, while we have you, uh, I wonder if you want to say a bit more about the kind of co-teaching that happens in the classes, because yeah. there's a question in the chat for you. Yeah. The yeah. other questions are uh, actually being answered uh, in the chat, so please uh, pay attention to the uh, comments there. So, so the co-teaching, there was very, there was lots of different kinds of co-teaching went on. In fact, each of these projects had different sorts of models. The Chinese one used what are some people will know as Hanban teachers. So they're linguistic specialists and they are qualified teachers, but they're not Scottish teachers. And they worked in collaboration with the Scottish primary teachers. Uh, who didn't know any Chinese. So there was a kind of sharing of expertise there um, and a very interesting kind of modeling of, as a result of how do you learn a language and what is it for. Um, in the uh, 
parent-based one where the Shona was the language that was um, used there. Um, it was again about the parents who were fluent Shona speakers, um, introducing both the teachers and the children who, who were not, some of the children were Shona speakers, but the others were not, um, to the language and um, about how you can use it uh, in the local community, which was something that the teachers had no experience of. Not only did they not speak Shona, but they had no experience of its use in the community. So again, there was a lot of um, modelling of how that might happen and then discussion among the teachers about how would they do this with other languages that they might use in future. So that's what I'm saying about the starting of discussion amongst teachers about different ways of teaching languages and kind of challenging their assumptions about what you need to know and be able to do. Um, and then in the third project, which used the mother tongue, other tongue um, poetry competition as a kind of starting point, um, it was the children who taught the languages and they taught them to each other, um, but they taught them very much in the context of um, the writing of poetry. So the sorts of things that the children decided were really important starting points for the languages that they were learning were very different from the count to 10, learn the colours, shapes, uh, number, number, that sort of thing. Um, they were about how to feel in this language and how to describe things and how th do things rhyme and what does it sound like and why, and why is the writing different and how can you work it out? Um, so it, in some ways a kind of language awareness thing, but also a deep engagement with what poetry is and how it crosses over, over languages, which the children managed and the teachers kind of facilitated and became very interested in and learned a lot from themselves. So the co-teaching operated in lots in different ways in each of these projects. So uh, let me just see what's in the chat. Uh, there is a question, I think, from Lourdes. Is that right? Um, about why uh, you think university languages, do you want to ask that question directly? Hello, uh, I want to ask the question to the speakers. Why yes. do you think that universities, the teaching of languages in universities is untouched, but some of the, com you know, the practices you have mentioned? All of you mentioned Spanish as a language like mother language, but it's also a community language in some of our cities or Arabic, which are languages that we are teaching. Why we are so reluctant to leave the classroom and go out to speak to those communities. I am a language teacher at university, so that's one, that's my interest. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, Petrus, do you want to uh, try and start? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for this question, Lourdes. Uh, as it happens, it underpins some current work we're doing at the University of Westminster about highlighting and um, acknowledging, celebrating and integrating the linguistic diversity that we have within the university um, to uh, change how the University of Westminster views itself as a multilingual university and also uh, within my school of humanities where we teach uh, and have degrees in languages how we can incorporate the linguistic resources of our of our students and staff um, more thoughtfully into our language pedagogy at higher education level it um i i, I have to, i don't know the extent to which all language classrooms are untouched by these ideas um, I believe there is research done in multilingualism in higher education um, that highlights uh, some good practice, but I agree with you that a lot more needs to be done um, for this. And um, I've, I believe there's now more attention that's being paid by um, our scholarly community on universities as multilingual spaces. And I hope to see that the, um, the outcomes, the outputs of this, this research will um, feed directly into teaching practice at university level. But so stay tuned for, for more on this. I think recognizing the fact that uh, some of these uh, um, so-called um, uh, modern foreign language or European languages like Spanish, like French, are actually community languages actually used by some of the immigrant and ethnic minority communities, especially those from Latin America, uh, but also Africa, of course, with regard to French, is a first a step forward to recognizing, uh, to, uh, uh, towards uh, recognizing and valuing uh, the significance and importance of the so-called community languages. And also, you know, uh, starting to shape the content 
of uh, modern foreign language education. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, thank you very much for that uh, reminder, Cordella. I think it is time to uh, uh, wrap up. Uh, thank you, uh, remains for me to say a huge thank you to our speakers today. And of course, to the uh, um, all the people who raised uh, really interesting and important questions and comments. Uh, this is really only one step towards uh, a future uh, of uh, uh, modern language uh, research and uh, modern language education, as I said at, at the beginning. So uh, we want to engage with all of you uh, in further uh, conversations. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, lovely. Thanks very much. So good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to uh, the two sessions on the Open World Research Initiative. Um, and I'm going to chair the first of those sessions. Uh, as most of you will know, uh, IRE, the Open World Research Initiative, was a major investment uh, in languages uh, by the AHRC, um, with the goal of transforming the research landscape and building very much on the Translating Cultures projects that went before. We're going to start this afternoon with the project entitled Cross Language Dynamics Reshaping Community and their intervention on modern languages, disciplinary identity and interdisciplinary potential. The PI, Steve Hutchings, will speak first. He will also deliver Andy Byford's contribution because Andy's not able to be with us. And then we will have Naomi Wells followed by a, a QA. and i So over to Steve, thank you. Thank you. Um, whoops. One second, slideshow. So you can see my slides, yes? Yeah, good. Um, I, I, I perhaps should clarify that um, what I'm going to speak about is, 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 is kind of relates to all of the projects. So I'm, I'm using our our project cross language dynamics as a starting point, but I'm going to try and give an overview of um, of what Auri was doing um, as a whole, and then you'll get more concrete examples from from other speakers. So um, um, I, I think all all of us, or certainly all of the Auri PIs, are agreed that that um, there's a danger in 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 using the language of crisis in in relation to to modern languages. Uh, we can talk ourselves into a crisis that, that perhaps is, um, um, is of a lesser order than, than is actually the case. N nonetheless, to, to the extent that, 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 that there is a problem, um, then part of it has to do with um, our identity. Um, the fact that we cover such a vast range of specialisms with multiple different critical vocabularies and the confusion around those way those lexicons speak or don't speak to one another is has contributed to this discourse of crisis around multilingual uh, uh, um, uh, modern languages now on the one hand i think there's there's a tendency to over agonize um if you talk to historians let alone scholars and teachers from area studies film studies and english you'll find that they will also all talk to you about identity issues um, in their own disciplines. They also conceive of their disciplines as, he as heterogeneous and, and hybrid. Um, on the other hand, the, the greater vulnerability uh, that we tend to feel as a result of this um, hybridity, I think can actually be turned to our advantage so that our acute awareness and sensitivity to the heterogeneity of our discipline can, can be used to good effect. And we can use those connections to build alliances across disciplinary boundaries um, uh, and to carry out impactful research tackling big questions. Um, Andy's going to say a little bit more about that particular issue. Um, or I'm going to um, speak on Andy's behalf about that issue shortly. Um, so um, the um, uh, what is specific to modern languages is 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 how we conceive of the role of language and languages. 
Um, I'm sure all of us have had these awkward conversations with um, uh, people from outside our discipline, non-academics. So you do research. So does that mean you spend all your time researching Russian irregular verbs? And there's this look of puzzlement when you tell when you tell them that that's actually not what I do, and then that's actually not what most of my colleagues do, which isn't to sort of denigrate those who write, research Russian irregular verbs. I, I can think of several colleagues in other institutions that do some excellent work on Russian irregular verbs, but it's it, it, it's not what most people in modern language departments do. And of course, philology has sadly been somewhat marginalized now, and where it is to be found, it tends to be in linguistics. So this coming together of literary and cultural studies and the study of language, which was once the norm, is, is no, longer the, uh, um, no longer so. Um, just as an aside, I think we sometimes tend to internalize that problem by deprioritizing language teaching in relation to what we do under the uh, umbrella of cultural content. Um, but I, th I think um, one of the things uh, that Auri was, was intended to do was, was to promote modern languages' capacity to address big these big interdisciplinary agendas but without subordinating language to the needs of non-language disciplines. So to have language front and center and core to, uh, to, to all of the Auri projects and, and yet without seeing it merged or submerged within linguistics uh, and without wanting to embarrass my um, fellow PIs, um, I think, and I think they will agree that, that Auri has scored some really big successes in demonstrating that there, there is research that does address these big agendas that can be done and, and for which language is absolutely core and, and front and center. And I was just going to run few, very quickly a few, a few examples from across the projects. Um, so um, um, the Mates project did some excellent work on, on bilingualism um, and its role in cognition, in aging, um, dementia and, 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 and other illnesses and demonstrating how language research can really lead the field and make a compelling contribution to, um, to health agendas um, equally. Um, I'm sure if I were to give Janice the floor, she would, uh, she would um, do a much better job of, of telling you about how community sensitive language policy and the recognition of the value of multilingualism can contribute to the promotion of social he cohesion, particularly in regions with a history of conflict. And I know Janice has done some excellent work in the um, context of Northern Ireland. Um, and that's, I think, that's from one of your slides, isn't it, I think, uh, I stole. <laughs> Uh, and then equally creative multilingualism, um, the role of languages in the creative economy, how artists take inspiration from range of languages, um, collaborating not just with literature, film and theater scholars, but also record companies, museums, art galleries and theaters. And I'd imagine Rajinder will have more to say about that later on. Um, what I think is, is, is particularly impressive about creative, multilingual, uh, 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 <clears throat> creative multilingualism and mates is that they've demonstrated that the interdisciplinary work to be done by modern linguists cuts across the boundaries, not only with other humanities, but with the sciences as well. And I think both of those projects have, have, have done some really groundbreaking work in, in which they've worked as partners with the sciences. So uh, uh, Katrina, as, um, uh, as you know, probably many of you know, has, uh, has, has looked at um, uh, the role of metaphor as a universal linguistic phenomenon, phenomenon, how it manifests itself in different cultures and functions at the interface of cognition, emotion, embodiment, and, and language. Um, then, and there's a, uh, the pudding is presumably the, the globe, the world. Is that right, Catherine? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Something like that. She'll, uh... And then uh, if we go to the um, language acts, uh, the, they did a lot of work on theatre's relationship with translation. Again, in dialogue, not just with theatre and translation scholars, but also practitioners. 
and that enabled them to address questions around issues to do with whose right it is to, to read, interpret and retell our stories and, and our histories, contributing to an understanding of how beliefs cross cultures, time and space. Uh, there was a, uh, um, a separate sub-project in that um, um, in, in, in uh, language acts that looked at traveling concepts, um, focused on clusters of vocabularies in, in Iberia. So they looked at sort of issue of uh, terms such as civilization, tolerance in Europe, and how Iberia has been imagined and reimagined um, around those vocabularies, drawing on history, politics, translation, and area studies um, to deepen our appreciation of this process. I would, I would love to do something similar with, with Russia, in fact. So I, I think we found that the projects have, you know, they've been mutually inspirational. They've, 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 uh, uh, we've inspired one another from, um, from, uh, from familiarity with our work. Um, and that's a, uh, a, a shot from Language Acts. Um, Language Acts, of course, worked collaboratively with our project on digital humanities. And that, that is an excellent example, not only of cross-disciplinary work, but also cross-houry collaboration. I think all four projects had a different stake in researching what digital humanities means for, for modern linguists. And Name is going to say much more about that shortly. And I think just to conclude that, you know, it's in this sense that our is ability to use the fact that we were more than the sum of our parts. It was that that has really enabled us to intervene in cross humanities debates and showed the way ahead for, for the um, uh, modern languages as a as a discipline. So that was uh, that was my contribution. And then, as I said, Andy was going to be with us, but unfortunately, um, um, child caring duties called. So he has um, asked me to um, uh, to speak on his behalf. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to read what what he sent me. Um, so he was co-lead co of uh, our transnational community strand um, and professor of Russian. And if, if you're familiar with our project, he's contributed several blog posts focused precisely on the disciplinarity and interdisciplinarity of modern languages. Um, he's written several excellent posts, one of which is entitled For Heterogeneity and Pluralism in the Modern Languages Ecology. And here he argues that modern languages are not a discipline, but a sector, which is not only multi, inter and cross-disciplinary, but also extremely complex in terms of its actual and potential functions and identities beyond academia. And this is undeniably a challenge for modern languages, but one that can be turned into an asset, provided that first the sector works together collaboratively, and second, that it accepts and makes the most of its pluralism, which was the point I was trying to make earlier. So he too argues that heterogeneity is, is a weakness only if it translates into fragment, fragmentation, unhealthy competition, or cross-disciplinary intolerance. It becomes a strength if the different parts of the sector recognize that they're all essential contributors to its ability to thrive in many different niches in what a complex modern languages ecology, academic and non-academic should look like. It's fostering this perspective doesn't mean um, a free for all, um, but it does require a careful elaboration of what's distinctive to both the epistemology and the ontology under, under pinning modern languages. Uh, Andy attempted this kind of analysis in a couple of blog posts available on our website uh, of note as one entitled After Herder, Modern Languages and the Divisibility of Humanity and Language and Community, Tribe and Territory, Bridging Modern Languages with Area Heritage and Locality Studies. Key to those analyses is an effort to account for the complex multidimensionality of disciplinary dynamics within and beyond the discipline of modern languages. Can't be summarized in a few words, do check his blogs out. The underlying point, however, is that 
it's imperative to build research programs and university curricula that are fully conscious of and explicit about the epistemological tensions and quandaries that underpin them and are capable of working with and through these tensions. And our project, um, Cross Language and that Dynamics, reflected this principle by positioning its object of study across three interlocking axes, the multilingual, the translingual, and the transnational. And to give just three very brief examples, a multilingual strand project on Manchester's Arabic speaking diasporas, investigated both classical Arabic's function in making translingual connections across Muslim minority communities and the role of modern Arabic dialects in man maintaining transnational links to countries of origin. So you have all three axes combined together in that one project. And a separate project on transnational hostilities in post-Soviet social media space, of course, I don't think he realized how topical that was going to be when he when he wrote it. Following the Ukraine crisis, explored tensions between the multiple linguistic identities of the combatants and Russia's or Russians continuing status as a medium of translingual communication. So there again, you have two axes coming together in one uh, field. And finally, a project on music's transnational role as a tool of UK soft power identified the capacity of opera to forge translingual audience communities, whilst also evaluating multilingual responses to it for the benefits of the Royal Opera. And that was Naomi's um, uh, project, uh, and that seems to be a an appropriate point at which to conclude and hand straight over to Naomi. Thanks very much, Steve. Um, so I was, um, just to explain, I was a postdoc on the project um, and I led on the digital research strand um, with Jane Winters here at the School of Advanced Study. And I just also briefly just mentioned um, the work of our PhD student, Francielle Carpenedo, because she did some really exciting PhD research on social media. Um, and I'm going to talk today, though, about um, one of the main outcomes of the work I was doing, which was in collaboration with the Language Acts Project on um, with Paul Spence. And together we established the Digital Modern Languages Seminar Series, which has also led to a Digital Modern Languages section on Modern Languages Open. And we've just recently published our launch issue, which I would really encourage you to read. And it also includes other contributions from across um, our um, but I just kind of explained the reason behind why we launched this initiative is we felt there was a real need to focus on community and capacity building in relation to digital research in modern languages. Because I do think it's fair to say that modern languages in the UK has lagged behind other humanities disciplines in relation to digital humanities in terms of embedding digital research in modern languages and embedding modern languages in digital humanities. There are exceptions, and um, Paul and I were very influenced by Thea Pittman and Claire Taylor's article on this subject, um, a strong emphasis on digital literacy and kind of more pedagogical research. And there are some important modern languages, kind of historical databases or digital editions. But overall, it was it kind of connects to what Steve was saying, a bit fragmented. And I do think this connects to interdisciplinarity in modern languages to a degree that it does sometimes risk being what are quite disconnected pockets of research across modern languages. Um, but the issue was not just fragmentation. There are also some big gaps. Um, I think particular gap is the study of contemporary digital culture across languages. And I think that's quite striking if we consider how central the study of culture is to what we do in modern languages. Um, and I think also if we think about undergraduate modern languages programs, researchers who have come through that training should actually be ideally placed to be studying digital cultural forms and practices. So if we think about one of the challenges that are often discussed in studying digital culture is the kind of multi multimodal, the multimedia kind of nature of these texts. And yet if we think of modern languages undergraduates, they're quite unique in that they do bridge literature, film, art, history, linguistics, and that would almost seem to be the ideal skill set for someone to be studying digital culture. Um, so I do think we do need to have a discussion 
still an ongoing discussion about what is holding us back from responding to these new cultural forms and practices associated with the digital world. And it's a cliche that I always go back to Stuart Hall, but I always, it is interesting to look at the emergence of cultural studies and Stuart Hall's frustration in particular with the humanities failure to engage with a changing cultural landscape. And I think particularly he, you know, these new popular cultural forms that were emerging in a period of social and to a degree, again, technological change where we can see parallels in the contemporary age. So I do think just to say, I think we need to see interdisciplinarity, not as something just done for its own sake, but rather as something that is vital for developing methodologies, analytical frameworks that allow researchers to feel equipped to respond both to societal change, but also how societal change does lead to these emergence of different types of cultural forms and practices. And so this isn't that, just as in this new landscape, it's not that books have gone, you know, literature is not gone, it still coexists with the digital. But I think if we do think about things like social media, I think many in the field don't see social media as something that is a modern language's object of study, particularly from a kind of cultural studies perspective. But actually, I think we've got a lot to say here. We have a lot of expertise, analytical frameworks that deal with narrativity, modes of representation, textuality, that are all very relevant to how we might bring new insight to these new cultural texts. Um, and I guess I'm quite conscious of kind of coming to the end of time. My final point is actually, I've, I've talked about interdisciplinarity. I, I actually think we need to go beyond interdisciplinarity in modern languages, because I think that still is connected to an idea of a fragmentation in that even if the field as a whole is seen as interdisciplinary, it often actually still maintains those boundaries within and even competition between different disciplinary perspectives within modern languages. And so I think what we need is actually a more holistic transdisciplinary identity that better equips modern languages researchers to respond to cultural and societal change. And this includes, for example, my own particular research area of digital cultural forms, which clearly do require more experimental methods, more kind of different approaches that are likely to sit at the intersection of existing disciplinary frameworks. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed, um, Naomi and Steve and indeed uh, Andy. So I'm sure there'll be some questions. We have five minutes uh, for some questions. Anyone like to start? If you'd like to use the raise hand function, that's probably the easiest way of doing it. Perhaps if I could uh, ask Steve a question just to, to get us started. Um, you talked about the need uh, for interdisciplinary thinking in research, but also in terms of curriculum design. And mm. I just wondered if um, your project had, had thought about, I guess, the challenges of doing that um, and of actually implementing it in, in, say, humanities faculties or indeed across mm -hmm. faculties. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I... I, I uh... I did actually write a blog of my own that that dealt in part with that uh, that that issue. It, it is one thing to preach interdisciplinarity in the curriculum; it's another thing to implement it. And there are no end of um, kind of practical hurdles that that, that you encounter. Uh, so, for example, at Manchester, we we recently did introduce a, 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 a new degree in modern languages with politics. You wouldn't believe how difficult it was. Um, there was resistance, and the resistance, I'm afraid, does normally come from the other discipline. It generally or often is the case that we need them more than they need us. It's certainly in terms of student numbers. So what's the incentive for them to collaborate? And, and then even if you get beyond that hurdle, uh, there's the, the, the there's the barrier of timetabling. Um, timetabling is a nightmare across, certainly at Manchester, I'm sure it's not only true at Manchester, um, across faculties is, is, is difficult in and of itself. When you're trying to 
um, figure out um, sort of um, uh, timetabling between a non-language subject and multiple other languages, all of whose students may be doing other things too, it, 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 it can become insuperable. Um, as I say, it does work. We, we, we've got combinations with politics and, and, and with business, um, so neither of which are short of undergraduate students. Um, we have managed to um, um, to get beyond those barriers. I, 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 I in in the blog, I was um, I was sort of um, deliberately provocative and controversial, and um, I, I, probably people, not many people here, agree with me. But um, I, I've sometimes wondered whether um, uh, time will come when we can solve these problems ourselves and begin to appoint people in our own disciplines who have the expertise and knowledge to deliver um, uh, modules on, for example, on Russian politics. Uh, just as an aside to that, something you'll probably find very difficult to believe, particularly what, with what's going on in the world now, um, the University of Manchester does not have a single specialist in contemporary Russian politics, not one. And that's, you know, that's why I'm constantly having to fend off the media and telling them, actually, I'm not really a specialist in contemporary Russian politics. Um, so there is a gap, there is, you know, there, there are gaps there that are um, not being filled. When I've talked to colleagues in politics, why do you not have a specialist in contemporary Russian policy? They ask me why. That's not the way that politics works anymore. Um, there was a huge battle to, to, to appoint the one specialist we have in contemporary Chinese politics for the same reason. So, you know, there's a gap and, and you know, we can fill that gap and at the same time, you know, mitigate some of those um, seemingly insuperable practical hurdles that often come when you, when you try to mount these, you know, idealized um, cross-disciplinary um, uh, curricular collaborations. Thanks, Steve. So I see we've two questions here. So we'll try and fit them both in and maybe if um, people could be brief in their responses so that we can uh, finish up in good time. So Godela, I think you were first. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I just wanted to come back to, um, I mean, both Andy uh, uh, and, uh, and Naomi, you were both talking about the um, heterogeneity and, and, and about, you know, how to overcome it or actually how to work with it. So, you know, either making most of the pluralism or in Naomi's, um, uh, you know, uh, idea of, of the trans transdisciplinary nature of, uh, of our work. Do you have any um, practical uh, ideas for how people could be incentivized to look beyond their own, you know, their, their own particular area, their own specialism, and to actually really engage with, because we have all these offers. We have, we have training programs, we have um, opportunities to talk to colleagues. Is there any, any recommendation that we might be able to set up and to, to follow uh, in order to really make this happen? Yeah, I'm happy to respond to that. I think, in a way, uh, I think the transdisciplinarity, as I say, is actually embedded in undergraduate modeling. I came through an undergraduate program. I didn't see the disconnect between, uh, actually, it's when you enter more into, you know, the structures of academia. Mm -hmm. And as an undergraduate, they came together. I didn't see, you know, this separation. I think we actually often impose later on. And so I think actually we often... We, we specialize more, obviously, when we do a PhD, and then we kind of specialize. And can we kind of incorporate what we do in the undergraduate, where we encourage students to take a breath to understand different cultural forms? And can we actually go back to that and think, well, you know, I did see the connections between linguistics and literature. I didn't see them as I was doing something totally disconnected. So I think maybe we need to question how can we bring what we see as valuable in that undergraduate program, which is the, those different, the ways students can bring them together and how can we bring that into what we do now? So I'll leave that for brevity, brevity there. Thank you, Naomi. 
Um, and a question from Charles, and then and then we'll close this part of the, the session and move on to the other next project. Well, just very quickly on this subject, I mean, Naomi, in being in charge of it, uh, with Simon Trafford for the under, uh, for the um, doctoral training program, can you say a few words about how doctoral students respond to some of the uh, Im imperatives that you're raising uh, around social media and around um, uh, digital humanities? Yeah, I think there is some there is some fantastic research being done at PhD. You know, I mentioned our own PhD students, but there's other. I think uh, Nicola um, has also supervised some fantastic research, and I think um, a lot of people in the project, a lot of digital research. One is we need to make sure there's a pipeline. Obviously, that's a major issue. We need to make sure the people doing that research at PhD level are able. It's a structural issue in modern languages that we don't lose them because of what is a very difficult employment context for those researchers. I would say, though, people who aren't doing digital research in their PhD are not always that interested in, you know, we don't actually find a huge, if they say that, well, this isn't my PhD research, and getting PhD researchers who aren't doing digital research in modern languages to understand why, you know, as part of their future careers, as I say, it's not about abandoning what they know already, but I think there is also still even some conservatism within the PhD community to saying I'm not a digital researcher. I think we need to say digital researchers are everyone. You know, we, we don't need that identity anymore. It's not I'm a digital researcher, you're not. How do we accept we live in a hybrid world that is digital and non-digital? So, yeah, it's a challenging one. Thank you, Naomi, and, and thanks to Steve and to Andy as well uh, for that session on cross-language dynamics. And we'll move over now to a uh, second hour project uh, we're going to discuss today, which is creative multilingualism. Um, and they're going to talk about connecting education sectors and language communities. Uh, the PI, Catherine Cole, is going to start, uh, followed by Julia Hofeber and Rajinder Judra. Uh, so over to you, Catherine. Thank you. Is it okay? Can everybody see? Yeah, good. So connecting education sectors and language communities was very much at the heart of Auri in many different ways. Um, and also absolutely central to all the work we um, all four programs did both together with each other and with other institutions. So one of the, the, the key kind of aims was to facilitate impact on education policy by building cross-sector, cross-institutional connections. So for example, collaboration um, on the development of a national languages strategy on education and skills. And I've, I've put um, the, the, the publication that came out of that um, on this slide um, involved collaboration um, between individuals um, and the programmes as a whole with the British Academy, UKRI and the AHRC. So the association of school and college leaders, a very important um, sort of connection with head, head teachers and schools with the British Council and with Universities UK. And the aim was also then to inform policy and practice through research. So through the research we were doing and also the kind of sort of, as it were, impact focused work we were doing. Addressing falling numbers um, was, um, sorry, addressing falling numbers of modern languages students was a key concern right the way through. We were engaging with pedagogy and curriculum design, engaging with assessment for um, issues like severe grading in modern languages, reinvigorating curricula, workshops with teachers and students are so going very much into practice, developing teaching resources that um, would be lasting um, beyond um, would last beyond the lifetime of Auri, an ambassador scheme on which Janice Carruthers led, um, which was cross Auri, built on roots into languages and involved mentoring by undergraduates. So you can see the sort of as it were, cross sector work that was going on there in very practical ways. It was a challenging project I and mean, it was successful, um, but also highlighted all the, the difficulties of, and, of, of implementing such um, initiatives. 
um, in the absence of um, specialized staff and time and, 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 and funding. Um, and part of the project was showcasing the vital connection between language and cultural diversity in an increasingly global society. And I think it's um, perhaps important to say that we were operating in a very challenging environment. Brexit happened right at the beginning um, of our project, was a huge um, blow really to what we were trying to do. Um, a highly dirigiste government um, policy has um, scuppered um, so many of the, the, the efforts to, in, um, to broaden the curriculum. Um, and this has gone into the very heart of teacher training and pedagogy. So one could say on the one hand, to, to some extent, there has been an hourly failure. On the other hand, I think it's also meant that we've been able to um, develop, pol um, develop policies and practices um, in the face of precisely the kind of um, difficulties that have faced the sector all along and will kind of carry on facing it, but also trying to um, build connections beyond um, the difficulties and um, create a, a, a forum and a, and a framework within which different parts of in different institutions are talking to each other um, and uh, really then also able to make a difference um, through that um, means. And language trends is um, one way in which... Um, of course, that has been happening um, simply in informing research, and we've been responding to that. Creating an impact in schools has been hugely important um, for all for all the projects. Um, and creative multilingualism um, did that in a wide variety of means through professional development of teachers, um, in order to change perceptions right across societies, society in schools, beyond schools, um, within business. Um, within communities, building networks and connections, um, fostering creativity, um, and um, thereby hoping to have an impact on motivation and actually being able to demonstrate that we were having an impact on, um, on motivation. So one of the key challenges and I think opportunities for Auri was to find different ways of um, creating an impact and evaluating that impact and um, being able to demonstrate that we have had an impact. And creativity um, in its interaction with motivation was absolutely fundamental to what creative multilingualism was working on in order to give scope for exploring the benefits of language learning and linguistic diversity beyond the arguments that concern the practical usefulness of languages. We um, sought to bring languages to life across um, sectors. Here you can see um, one of a series of videos we created for teachers that they can watch in their own time. Um, an event in the Ashmolean Museum involving um, uh, drama groups, including um, refugees in local schools in Oxford. Um, and that event had about 2,500 visitors in the Ashmolean Museum. So it was building a very direct link also with the creative sector in that way. Um, and here, finally, um, an example of a project we so we commissioned a composition from um, Lynn Marsh called We Are Children of the World, um, which was specifically for primary schools, celebrating the languages that are actually spoken in Oxford um, primary schools, but across the country, of course, and indeed across the world. So Arabic, Mandarin, Polish, Portuguese, Punjabi, Swahili, Urdu were all part of that composition, which all children um, then sang together. And the idea there was to improve social co cohesion locally, um, to celebrate minority languages, to show that they are live in the UK and that there's a huge potential there. Um, and to give the children experience of the creative dimension of languages um, and allow them to perform their piece in the Sheldonian Theatre, which is a splendid environment in Oxford, um, in the presence of the Vice Chancellor of Oxford um, and in the presence of the parents of the children. So they could, in a sense, see then and participate in that in that event. So that was one way in which we um, aimed to, as it were, fill a, a venue with a thousand people who were celebrating um, the 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 creative dimension of multilingualism. And I'll stop there and hand over to Julia, who will now talk about um, a, a more specific research-focused um, research, um, research focused work she was doing um, to show how research can underpin policy making. Okay, I will start sharing my screen then. Can you all see my screen? 
Can you see my screen? Is yes, it okay? that's great. That's great. Brilliant. Okay. So I will be uh, providing a bit of an overview of one of the strands of the Creative Multilingualism Project as a kind of case study, zooming in on strand seven, which investigated linguistic creativity in language learning. And I was working as a postdoc um, on the strand together with Suzanne Graham from the University of Reading. The background of um, our research was that the National Curriculum for Modern Foreign Languages, published in 2014 at the onset of planning the project, suggested that learners should read authentic L2 literary texts in the second language classroom because exposure to L2 literature will stimulate L2 creative expression. And that's something that's particularly difficult in the L2 to achieve, to be creative in the second language. And was also assumed um, uh, that it would engage um, second language learners, especially um, at secondary school level. So our aim in strand seven was to, to test this claim um, empirically. Um, so our research question was, how does exposure to L2 literary texts affect learners' general creativity and specifically their L2 creative writing skills? So we focused on pupils in year nine. Um, so this is a stage um, during secondary school when they are making a decision as to whether or not to continue um, with modern foreign languages. So it was um, considered to be a crucial stage. Um, and the languages we focused on were those that are represented um, in um, the um, curriculum currently. Um, so we focused on French and German. Um, and um, our participating schools, uh, in terms of participating schools, we had nine schools that worked with intervention materials based on literary texts. And uh, we had 10 schools that worked on intervention materials based on factual texts. So in terms of the intervention, um, the teachers were provided with very detailed teaching materials in the shape of PowerPoints, um, which were based on either literary texts, and we decided to, fo um, to focus um, or concentrate on poetry, because that's particularly um, a particularly creative um, subgenre of literature, or factual newspaper-style texts, which were matched to the poetry, um, to the poems that we'd selected, um, based on certain vocabulary and grammatical features and difficulty level. And in our intervention materials, we made sure that these materials and the teaching approaches used were engaging um, and, and creative. So um, the intervention was administered throughout the time course of one school year in 2017 and 2018. And before and after the um, intervention, we administered pre and post tests assessing pupils' general creativity and L2 creative writing skills. Now, I'll talk a little bit more about what we mean with this. In terms of general creativity, we defined this as a general cognitive ability to generate solutions which are both functional and appropriate, but also original and novel. And L2 learning has been argued to enhance creativity because when you learn a new language, you also learn about new words and concepts. And this is assumed to generate additional connections and pathways for associative and divergent thinking. Now, we assess this divergent thinking abilities in the so-called abbreviated Torrens test for adults, which taps into both verbal and nonverbal creativity the verbal creativity tasks um, consist of idea generation tasks, and the nonverbal figurat figurative creativity tasks consist of picture completion tasks. Um, and this usually involves um, uh, the, um, um, the participant being shown a very basic starting shape, as you can see in the first column here um, on the image. And then they're asked to make a story out of this or a character. And here you can see in the middle column examples of responses that would be considered as more creative. And in the right hand um, column, you see examples of responses that would be considered as less creative. So in terms of tapping into L2 creative writing abilities, um, we pro provided um, our pupils at the beginning and the end of the intervention uh, with a picture and a essentially blank paper and very open-ended instructions to encourage creative writing. 
Um, so we asked them to look at the picture and write about the picture in the target language. And they could write whatever they wanted as long as it related to the picture. And then they had 10 minutes to do that. So in terms of what we found, we found that general creative ability was enhanced by exposure to L2 literary texts in this case, poetry. So the um, pupils um, that went to the schools that worked with the materials based on literary texts showed greater improvements in general cognitive creative ability than those um, that had worked with the factual texts. In terms of the um, L2 creative writing abilities, some students benefited more from literary texts, whilst other be others benefited more from factual texts. So here the picture was less clear. So the recommendation would be to use a variety of text types to address the diversity amongst student needs. And then as a post hoc um, finding, um, we found that although in our instructions, we'd asked students to, um, to write in the target language, we found a lot of incidences of translanguaging. So they were not only using target language items, but also bringing in um, items from their first language or from other foreign languages that they knew. And we looked at this in a bit of detail, in a bit more detail, and what we found was a positive correlation between the instances of translanguaging and target language performance in the creative writing task. So this would suggest that it's a good thing to allow students to use any language freely in the second language classroom, because it may support the L2 creative writing output. So rather than not being able to write anything um, uh, in a writing task, um, if you allow them to draw upon their multilingual competence as emerging multilinguals, um, they may actually be able to write um, something that involves translanguaging. So in terms of impact and dissemination, um, we conducted quite a lot of workshops, initial training workshops for participating teachers. Then there was the intervention in itself. Teachers and pupils were working with the materials over two school terms. And then we also conduct, conducted an end of project workshop um, in which we shared the findings with the project teachers. So at every stage of the project, we tried to really integrate the teachers that were participating in the project very actively in the research um, process, making it a mutual learning experience. And then we conducted further post-project um, workshops with teachers and trainee teachers and the mentors who support them in school at SOAS, um, University of London, the University of Reading, and the University of Cambridge, as well as present, we presented the materials and findings for school teachers in Oxford at the Sir Robert Taylor Society Conference. We also um, continue to make the teaching materials we created um, available online. So we're creating and developing further um, these materials as part of the work done by the Department of Education's National Center for Excellence in Language Pedagogy. And the materials are freely available on the Creative Multilingualism website. So I think that our project um, or our strand also had some additional impact in terms of um, teacher professional development. Strand one asked their teachers, um, what impact did the project have on your own teaching? And all the teachers felt that it had impacted their teaching in a variety of positive ways, as exemplified by the following responses. They said things such as, it opened me up to a lot of poetry I didn't know about. I love teaching with authentic texts and real language. And the whole class was involved, not just teacher-led. We'll use these poems in the future. And um, we had similar positive feedback from um, pupils that had participated in the project. So this shows that um, um, our project may have had a long lasting impact on changing teaching practices in the second language classroom. Okay, hey, so this is was everything I had to say about our strand seven, and I will um, now hand over to Rajinda and stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Julia. Kathy, if you could just share my slides, please. Um, I appreciate it. It's 20 past already, so I'll keep very brief because there must be minutes. So I'm going to literally cut 
back. So I want to really just share some comments and, and thoughts about the project overall in terms of ARI and specifically creating multilism in particular. So thanks to my colleagues who went before me, particularly to Stephen who gave the overarching framework for ARI. And just before I move more into detail with our creative multilingualism projects, I just want to kind of really pay homage here to Multilingual Manchester as well, which started off in 2010. And the reason for doing that is to remind us that there is existing uh, research programs that we have perhaps been part of or that exist that we might not know of. And it's about how do we keep that legacy going? Are we obviously built on some of the research programs that went before and Janice mentioned translating cultures, but also Multilingual Manchester was existing since at least to 2010, 2010, which Professor um, Yaren Mattress at the University of Manchester, where Stephen is based, and which was my previous institution before 2016, is where this work was housed. So how do we kind of, in, in a sense, map and locate some of the fantastic resources, work that is existing, and how do we build on some of this good practice? So not necessarily moving forward and thinking about, oh, how do we start again and reinventing the wheel? But there is some wonderful work, not least over this last uh, four, five, 10 plus years that have been going on that we really need to build on. And one of the strengths really for me, one of the wonderful things about Multilingual Manchester was how it draw on the diversity and the strengths and the challenges of Manchester, a city with over 150 languages, uh, where a lot of its schools, particularly the inner city schools and comprehend modern comprehensive schools, had, had many community languages. And this really then talks to us about demographics. Oh, sorry. OK, and this speaks to us about the future and the demographics of modern languages and community languages, particularly in a modern and diverse nation of Britain. So how are we going to be serving those communities to what effects and purposes? And then this obviously has a knock on effect in terms of services, service providers and education and how education is impactful across those sectors. Can we move across to the second slide, please? Thank you, Cathy. So this is um, coming into creating multilingualism now. So this is a book that we published, uh, a manifesto. It was published online. It's, it's widely available for those of you who don't know it. You can access it through the uh, publisher's website or very easily through our own website. And in some ways, I'm starting off with, if you like, a conventional way of thinking about education and the study of that. It's a book, but actually this was an open access book. It was aimed at lifelong learners, particularly from, if you like, upper secondary and onwards. So it was a way of bringing together our research across the seven strands into an accessible uh, language format and uh, image based format and hyperlink format, which hopefully uh, a younger audience or a younger demographic were much more used to. The chapters were broken down and could easily be used in classroom settings, but also workshop settings and shared across sectors. And this also speaks to the digital humanities as well in terms of making our research, but the findings of our research quite accessible to a wide range of communities. So in what ways really is using this book format, if you like the old modern analog way, but taking it forward into the digital, in what ways can we draw on the resources to use um, language to work not just within education sectors, but beyond education sectors as well. So we're engaging with people from an early age, as I said, upper secondary and onwards, but also across sectors where we can share some of this work, where the language is, is not so esoteric or is not so discipline or academic specific, and it can be welcoming, it can be inviting, and it can be a spur for other ways of engaging people. So we worked in a range of ways, as Stephen and other of my colleagues who went before me we talked about we worked with creative professionals, a whole range of artists, both within the classroom and outside of the classroom. And of course, this work is resource specific. I appreciate not everybody has infinite uh, budgets in order to be able to do that work. But it is important, I think, if we're able to think about how education sectors uh, are going to work across sectors, we do need to think about the resource implications that that brings and also what each sector re perhaps requires from each other in terms of starting point conversations, in terms of, as I talk about future demographics, so the future demographics of language, are they changing by city by city, by region by region? What will that look like in three to five years, in 10 years, within a generation? And are we kind of upskilling and being ready for that? Next slide, please. 
this is um, an example of working across sectors. So this is uh, on our strand, um, uh, strand for languages in the creative economy, which I led with my colleagues from Oxford and elsewhere. And this is where we worked with a group, an, an arts collective in Birmingham, who worked with young people and young people, particularly in terms of their wants, their needs, their aspirations, uh, their hopes, uh, and, and also some of their anxieties. And this was from work done with Beat Freaks, Beat Freaks in Birmingham. Again, more details on our website. And we we produced a report. So this was looking at the education. So we worked with 10 artists who had different language uh, abilities and, and worked with in theatre, in poetry, in spoken word, in film and so forth, across, if you like, the range of the creative in performing creative industries in and around Birmingham, the West Midlands. So they had been educated in particular ways. And some of them were not formally educated in community languages or modern languages, but they came to it through dialect, through slang, through street performance, through street culture. And so it was a way of engaging and making meaningful their resources, their skills, but then also looking at the ways in which sometimes this has its challenges. So how do we work with someone who's not, if you like, formally trained, but equally has so much to offer? And also in what ways can we learn from some of the policy implications? In what ways in creative industries? A lot has been made about that in the last um, a decade or so, and particularly in the, in the last several years, as, as, as ways of kind of upskilling and thinking about um, industry development and, and skill development for young people. Well, in what ways does the creative industry need to be ready for, if you like, a diverse workforce, but also a multilingual workforce, which at times is not formally educated or trained, but has so much to offer through the informal economy and through informal means, which then become formal, particularly when they put on, if you like, plays, spoken for word or so. So this, again, was a way in which that report not just speaks to colleagues like ourselves, but hopefully also to artists and other sectors as well. Next slide, please. And this is perhaps the, the next two slides is where I really want to finish. In doing the work of languages and in thinking about these future directions, EDI, equality, diversity and inclusion, is, is, is a huge important buzzword. How meaningful are they in our work? How meaningful are they in our institutional practices beyond the policies that we're required by law to do? By doing the creative work of languages, modern and community languages, we're serving a new generation. We're serving different generation of, of languages which perhaps haven't been served under the modern languages banner. It is also a way of thinking about directly and indirectly some of the EDI issues. So for example, climate change in languages, how would that work in, in, a, in a classroom and beyond classroom setting? The business needs requirement in a creative industries, what would that mean? A protected characteristic such as gender and sexuality, how could we devise programs which took some of this work into the community. So this is very much about working with a diverse set and a range of communities than perhaps modern languages has because of its historical baggage and where it's come from in terms of its European setting in the past. And I think we do need to kind of think about those challenges in, 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 in hand in hand with other challenges like EDI across sectoral issues. And then the final slide, please. So this is... Um, thinking about working within education, but also beyond across sectors. This is from um, the, a video that we had of our launch exhibition, our Slanguages launch exhibition, which took place in Wolfson right at the beginning of the project, 2016, 2017, when we were in a very different world. And this was bringing together artists who worked in a range of different community languages, uh, non-Western primarily. And here is a still from that video, which you can watch on YouTube or access through our website. And it brings together two artists, artists the, the, the the gentleman with the hat on is Lekan Babalola, a Grammy award winning Nigerian percussionist. And the gentleman on the right is Article, a spoken word rap musician, grime artist from Birmingham. Now they both lived in Birmingham for a number of years. They hadn't met until it was our project, which brought them together serendipitously. They went on to produce an album together as a result of this, having met at the exhibition. And I think this was a moment where they had a convivial exchange. What's also interesting is Article has now gone on, and not just because of the work of languages, even though perhaps I'd like to claim that, but he's now gone on to be the musical director for the Commonwealth Games, which are taking place in Birmingham later on. And again, I'm sure he'll be bringing and drawing on his skills, both from the education sectors, the workshops he's been doing, the work he's been doing with us, and of course, more besides in terms of his plethora of work to, to put on a, a something really exciting and dynamic for the Commonwealth Games. So this is also about 
kind of generating and creating those possibilities, some, some unintended, some unknown, but also thinking about how we need to think about as education, not just within the formal ways as one or two of my colleagues have talked about, but informally and also speaking across a range of community languages. Perhaps these community languages in our modern diverse cities are the future to the vitality of how our, our, our subject disciplines might survive in the coming generations. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Rajinder. And thanks also to Julia and to Katrine. Um, Charles has just given me a little bit of flex here um, so that we can have a couple of questions, a shorter break, um, and then uh, a little bit of extra time on the end of the next session so that all the projects um, get the same time. So um, a couple of questions. If you just use the, the raise hand function. I wonder, um, Julia, could you say a little bit about um, the implications of your findings for curriculum change? Just, just very briefly, you know, what, what sort of curriculum change might you argue for in the light of the findings that, that, that your strand came up with? Um, I mean, to some extent, it's more like a confirmation of what the curriculum already states, right? It, it was kind of like testing because the curriculum is already suggesting that we should be using L2 authentic materials. So um, literary, literary texts. So um, in some way, it's more of a confirmation that that really is a good idea. And it, it had some positive impacts on, the, on, on creative writing abilities and general creativity. And also the fact that um, teach uh, sort of like um, exposure to certain types of L2 materials, enhanced general cognitive abilities, I think speaks more generally in favor of learning another language, you know, so, um, and, and creating the teaching materials in a way that they are engaging, using authentic texts. Um, and um, sort of one thing that we also made sure was that our materials gave the pupils an opportunity to engage with them in a creative way. So we would ask them to draw a picture about the poem they just read and things like that. Great, thank you. That's, that That's, a question. Question. That's great. Questions come into the um, chat, which I think I'll put uh, to Catherine as one of the, the PIs, and um, which is how can we ensure the sustainability of all the projects and resources? Yes, that's clearly a clearly a challenge. Um, I think one of the ways is by working together with the various organizations with whom we've made contact, the, um, the individuals, the HRC's current initiatives that we've been hearing about already. I think um, keeping, as it were, the, the work live in that way is absolutely crucial. Um, and we've also all, I think, worked hard to um, try and create resources that um, have a lifetime beyond the project on websites, in publications. Um, the Mites Journal, for instance, um, is very important in that so that it's a, a forum that can, as it were, receive new publications as they come, come along. So I think all those um, ways and, and, and trying to make um, work um, accessible, openly accessible. So the composition that we um, commissioned the uh, the manifesto volume um, that they are all um, freely downloadable and that means that um, there are no restrictions on using them in terms of cost or practicality but yes it's a challenge thanks Catherine and I know certainly what the projects have done is feeding very much into the thinking of the three fellows who spoke this morning um, in terms of influencing and shaping to some extent where they take the next conversation about modern languages research Okay, anyone else have a question? We could fit one more in, um, and if not, if not, we'll take a break. Well, um, just, just, very, just very quickly, I mean, just, since right, it, if you a couple of minutes, I'm, I think absolutely, Virginia, what you're talking about is very definitely the future and the way in which um, we, can, we can think about how we can connect so many different elements of, of, of what we do. The question is trying to embed that in the structures that we can all refer to, and that that and that is a real challenge. Uh, and I wonder if you could just expand a little bit more about how we could go, or we can pick this up in the conclusion. But that is an absolutely key point. 
Thank you, Charles. Absolutely. It, it's another challenge, as, as Catherine says. So it's partly to do with the resources. I mean, I think it was unprecedented. £16 million pounds was, you know, the overall budget that Auri and the HLC put aside for that. That was unprecedented. So will something like that come again? Brilliant if it could. But, but if not, how do we build on the legacies of what we've established? So thinking about the networks that are already in place and building up those ecologies through our schools, schools in conversations with those in the creative industries and those in the businesses as well. And some institutions are better at, say, um, at, at donors or sponsorship. So it's thinking about about connecting all of those dots as well and which is why I deliberately referred to multilingual Manchester you know started circa 2010 at the outset let's not forget some of the fantastic work that already exists there that's perhaps online in the dusty shelves of the, the, the internet how do we kind of reinvigorate and use and develop the good practice so it's not just forgotten and we're not thinking about reinventing the wheels to so to speak but we're, we're carrying on that thread as well but absolutely connecting the dots resources and uh, uh, speaking across sectors yeah, absolutely. Let's pick this up in the conclusion. Thank you. Janice very helpfully introduced the initiative um, in the previous session. And the, 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 the two sets of presentations there gave us a really rich flavour of the activity that's emerged from Auri, a really transformational set of activities. Um, the result of possibly, as Rajinda suggested, a once-in-a-lifetime investment um, in our subject areas. Um, by the uh, AHRC. Um, across the four projects, we've seen work setting agendas, driving interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary um, activity, building, again, as Rajinda said, on, on excellent um, past work. And crucially, and I think this links in um, to what Nicola was saying at the beginning of the day, um, providing a holistic, inclusive approach to languages, which holds together, and this echoes with Naomi, holds together the, the diversity and avoids fragmentation. And what, what I really like about these two sessions this afternoon is that they've given us core themes, which, as Steve said at the very beginning, link together the four hourly projects. Um, so first of all, we're going to hear from um, Meets or, or Mites, Wendy can rule on that, um, on demonstrating the relevance of research in modern languages to key issues of our time. Then in the second half of the session, we'll hand over to Language Acts and World Making um, for um, some presentations on connecting research and funding. So I'll hand over straight away to um, Wendy, Wendy Ayers Bennett, who is PI on the Multilingualism Empowering Individuals Transforming Societies project. She'll be followed by uh, Rory Finnan and then uh, Michal Omenin, um, who will, uh, will talk some more about their activity in that area. So over to you, Wendy. Thank you very much, Charles. I'm going to try and share my screen. That's great. That okay? we, yeah, we can see very clearly. Thanks, Wendy. Great. OK, so thank you very much. So as um, we've been hearing, um, I'm very grateful because Steve introduced a lot of these issues, um, contextualised what I'm going to say and gave examples from across the four projects. So that's going to save me a bit of time in my presentation. But all the projects um, had this innovative uh, dimension. We all brought together in inter interlocking research strands, disciplines and subdisciplines, which are rarely combined in an integrated research programme. Um, in our case, that was literature and culture, history of ideas, education, sociolinguistics, applied linguistics, but also cognitive science. Um, as Charles was just saying, there was this holistic uh, approach to languages. So as well as the traditional languages taught in our schools and universities, we looked at Asian languages, we looked at lesser taught languages like Ukrainian and Catalan, we looked at the community languages and we looked at the indigenous languages and we saw languages as a whole. And that's also allowed us to bring unusual language combinations into dialogue, which I think was very important. So it, Ukrainian and Catalan or modern foreign languages and EAL um, talking to each other in a way they don't traditionally do. But in particular, we wanted to create this new narrative about modern language as a discipline that has important things to say about key issues of our time, like conflict resolution, combating inequalities, social cohesion, health and well-being. Sorry, I'm just trying to change the slide now. Um, that leads us to think about a challenged approach, challenge-based approach to modern languages. And modern languages, of course, is centrally placed to be able to offer rich insights 
from different languages and cultures across time and space. Lots of these key issues of our time have often been thought of as problems for the social science scientists or hard scientists. But we found the, the role that uh, arts and humanities in general and modern languages in particular can play in, in bringing creativity, flexibility and new dimensions to these big questions. And this challenge based approach to modern languages sits very well in, in an interdisciplinary context. Of course, the definition of interdisciplinarity is very contested, but um, I've got one here from Klein, Klein and Newell talking about it as a process of answering questions, solving a problem or addressing a topic too broad or complex to be dealt with adequately by a single discipline or profession. IDS draws on disciplinary perspectives, integrates their insights through construction of a more comprehensive perspective. And of course, the kind of problems that I've been talking about, these, these are exactly the kind of complex problems, how to deal with healthy old aging, that require insights from a range of disciplines. Now, of course, it wasn't always possible to integrate findings across the, um, the, the strands. I, I don't want to idealize what we do, did. But one of the ways that we were able to work, work towards that was having research questions across the six strands. We had six, in fact, but I'm going to mention just three of them here, which I'm going to come back to um, after Rory has spoken. So thinking about the relationship between the individual and the society, whether that's a monolingual individual in a multilingual society or a multilingual individual in a predominantly monolingual society. Thinking about the opportunities and challenges of multilingualism, I think we here all know about the advantages, but what extent does multilingualism disadvantage individuals, dilute culture, fragment societies? And then what is the relationship between multilingualism, diversity and identity? We've heard a lot about that from the first two ARI uh, presentations. I'm gonna say something very briefly about two of the case studies that we looked at. And then um, Rory and Mihal are going to develop um, conflict, territori territoriality, nationhood and peace building. Um, as we've been hearing painfully and um, in a very difficult time, uh, nothing can perhaps be more topical and a key issue of our time than what's happening in Ukraine. Um, it, it's, 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 it's a very difficult time for Rory to speak today and I'm very grateful for him to carving out the time to, to join us when he's in huge demand from the international media. So this first slide is going to uh, echo very much with what Petros said today, so I won't dwell on it for a long, but um, as Petros pointed out, link language laws, choice of norms, choice of official languages for a national region create inequalities for those who don't speak those languages, questions of access to education and other public services, which simply may not be available in the speaker's L1. And so these questions of linguistic human rights need to be a, a key part of broader discussions about equality and inclusion and diversity, including in public policy. Um, we need to have that reflex about what role does language play in public policy. And we explored this through a range of theoretical and historical studies of language standardization across a range of language types and geographical areas. Two wonderful studies by Andreas Krogel and John Bellamy, two of the postdocs. Um, sociolinguistic studies of minoritized languages in multilingual contexts, Luxembourgish, Catalan, Breton, and so on. And attitudinal analysis of non-standardized varieties. What, how do people feel how do the police feel if they meet a young person who, who speaks a contemporary urban vernacular? Then as has already been mentioned, but the cognitive benefits of multilingualism. And I think this was particularly where we felt the working in an interdisciplinary team um, was transformative, bringing in a qualitative dimension to research that had been purely quantitative to this point. So thinking about, for example, the lived experience of a bilingual child and their family when they have autism. So as well as building on the work about the positive effects of multilingualism on brain disease, including slowing down at the onset of dementia and better recovery from stroke, the uh, researchers also looked the study of language learning in patients with dementia and their carers, thinking about what this meant in terms of the participants' well-being and looking at how it helped older people in early stages of dementia combat feelings of loneliness and isolation. 
And this research was translated into a cultural uh, output, um, a play called Remember Us, which traced the, the journey of a Gallic English bilingual woman who, as she has her dementia develops, um, returns to be able to speak Gallic to the point where she can only in, communicate in Gallic and, and can no longer communicate with her husband who only speaks English. Um, and interestingly, in a virtuous circle, then that has in turn um, inspired further uh, funded research. So I'm now going to move over to, to Rory, who's going to pick up the story about um, peace building in Northern Ireland. Uh, thank you, Wendy. I think that's me. Is it Wendy? Yes. 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 Uh, so um, uh, hello, everybody. I'm sure you don't need any introduction to uh, conflict in Northern Ireland. And you'll be aware, of course, that language has been uh, a key element of that in, in recent years, so much so that it brought about the uh, um, determination for a time, indeed for three years, of, of our local government in, in Stormont. Uh, and uh, um, it has been a problem here for, for a very long time, the whole question of the politicization of the Irish language. Indeed, it had been said of one prominent Sinn Féin member uh, that he uh, equated the speaking of the Irish language and every word uttered in Irish as a, another bullet in the struggle, uh, which uh, perhaps he may not uh, have one up to right now if, if that were put to him. But in any case, uh, so Irish had been a language of resistance at the outbreak of the, uh, of the Troubles of 1969, or increasingly at least, into the early 70s. Uh, and there's no doubt that there had been a link between uh, the Irish language and, and uh, republicanism. Uh, we have to be honest about that. Uh, the question of uh, attitudes towards the language more generally, uh, I think, have been considered in a sort of a, com a, um, a context of exceptionalism, that this is just us and this is how we are and we're different. Uh, and m one of the reasons why I enjoyed being very much a part of the MITS team was uh, how uh, that gave me at least the capacity uh, to articulate uh, that that was not the case and that there was a global context for language and conflict, uh, and particularly through discussions with Rory and Ivan and others on the MEDS team, uh, we were able to broaden that out uh, and bring that to bear on our discussions with, with project partners, for example. Uh, the linguistic conflict in, in Northern Ireland, of course, was much further back, and it was linguistic conflict in Ireland pre-partition, uh, and indeed, the first politicization of language in Ireland was around English, to be, to be, to be accurate. Uh, uh, we can go back as far as the 14th century, when the monarchy was getting nervous about people becoming bilingual. So the, first, so the descendants of the first settlers becoming bilingual was a cause of nervousness because that was seen as degenerate and, uh, uh, and potentially undermining the colony. So if you can move to the next slide, Wendy. Uh, so uh, we have been on a bit of a hook here, is what I'm saying, in terms of the question of of, of Indigenous languages and uh, language rights. Uh, the question of visibility is particularly difficult for us. Um, two Indigenous languages, Irish and Ulster Scots, are acknowledged in the European Charter for Regional Minority Languages, which was ratified by the UK in 2001, if I remember correctly. Uh, before that, the two languages were first mentioned in the local context in, in the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. Uh, but despite that, and of course, we have yet to get to a position where there's official status for those two languages. I'll be talking a little bit about that in a moment. But we have no overarching trilingual policy and visibility. So even though the two languages are recognized externally and internally, there is no overarching policy because that is clearly unpalatable for too many people. Uh, there are limits on Irish and Ulster Scots in the public space because of what I would say the desire for invisibility by, by various interest groups. And this applies to both languages for different reasons. So in the case of Irish, it's because of the perceived political affiliations of the Irish language. Uh, that is breaking down a bit, but that certainly is true historically. It applies to Ulster Scots too for a different reason entirely, in that there is some discomfort among those who might naturally be supporters of the Ulster Scots language in it being applied to the written medium. In other words, that they're more comfortable with it in the oral medium and fear because of its linguistic proximity to English that is subject to ridicule when it appears in the written form. Uh, and that poses some difficulties because after all, we have a language body, uh, the Ulster Scots Agency not just responsible for language, but also for cultural and heritage in the Ulster Scots case. But that means there's some contradictions in, in between the, 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 uh, the reality in terms of um, the government agency and its work and what the community may want. So the next slide, Wendy. Uh, so can we get to uh, a new narrative for Northern Ireland in the context of multilingualism and shared space? 
which was one of the key issues for me in, in, in reflecting on the work of the METS project. I have had a long association with the Northern Ireland Placement Project, which was first set up here in 1987, uh, and it was about exploring language in a safe space. Uh, um, yes, an academic space, uh, but nonetheless a, a safe space, one with great community engagement it emerged over the years. Uh, but uh, what METS uh, brought to the table, for me at least, was the potential for um, internationalizing that and for also bringing in, uh, interdisciplinarity uh, into the, uh, the whole issue of multilingualism. The project had already proven that there was multilingualism in this society in times past, but METS was able to ground that uh, in the contemporary context more strongly for, for me, uh, and also, as I say, the interdisciplinary dimension is really important. Reconciliation through language then is something that is of great interest now in this society because there are some very strong and prominent voices in what is the Protestant Unionist Loyalist community, particularly Linda Irvine's Thurdus project in East Belfast, which was established, if I remember correctly, in 2012 and was a partner of ours in MITS uh, and which has been uh, doing the power of work for cultural diversity and linguistic diversity in the east of the city, uh, which of course would not be associated with Irish speaking historically. Uh, and what was most interesting for me in terms of the terrorist project was that in opening up uh, the possibility for engagement with the Irish language in the Protestant or uh, Unionist loyalist community, that actually made some people in the Catholic Nationalist Republican community uh, uh, encourage them more to engage with the language because they felt more comfortable uh, learning the language in a space where people came together and people weren't divided. And I think that was something which was, came through very strongly. So uh, some green shoots there. Uh, but the whole issue of language and conflict is still very deeply rooted here. So I'll pass over now to Rory. Thanks, Milhal. I have to say, uh, first of all, what a privilege it was to be a part of this project, um, to be uh, with such wonderful colleagues uh, as Wendy and Milhal. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Oh, great. Um, it was a, a real privilege. And as Wendy mentioned before, um, a lot of the conversations and engagements we've had over the years have led me to be thinking about the next steps after this uh, horrific uh, uh, war in Ukraine right now, these attacks by the Russian Federation. Um, believe it or not, um, I'm thinking a lot about next steps with uh, reconciliation and how culture and humanities-based approach can really be productive. So um, I, I just want to talk about a few things here um, that uh, carry on from what Michal has already mentioned with respect to conflict and res uh, reconciliation and frame just a couple of issues that we in the project, uh, particularly my colleague Ivan Kozachenko, who is a, a sociologist, how we work together, what we were targeting in our work and how we brought a modern languages, humanities led approach, as well as one that was very clearly open to interdisciplinarity since Ivan indeed was a, a sociologist. So one of the first things we we're focusing on is approaching a country like Ukraine from new perspectives as uh, scholars based in Western institutions. So one of the major myths about a country like Ukraine is one that um, language use somehow dictated political identity in the country. Um, the other one was that the linguistic diversity was somehow linguistic adversity. And this is something that I want to raise now in the context of the, the horrific events unfolding, because for years, uh, particularly Vladimir Putin, would raise Ukraine's di linguistic diversity, its multilingualism, as some sort of cause for conflict. So he would justify particular military uh, adventures in Crimea, for instance, in what became occupied Eastern Ukraine, as a, an act to somehow defend Russian speaking um, citizens in uh, that part of Ukraine. Um, that is an absurd stereotype of a massive uh, constituency of people who actually um, were multilingual. That is, they were Russian speaking, but they were also possibly Ukrainian speaking. Um, there was nothing about their identity that latched itself on uni uh, uh, unilaterally to uh, their ethnic identity, their political identity. So this has been a rather pernicious stereotype or one might even say a lazy assumption in a great deal of Western scholarship about a country like Ukraine. And so we um, sought to uh, focus on this, excuse me. Um, sorry. Um, that was the, uh, the first aspect of our work is contending with this problem of um, uh, 
the myth about Ukraine's uh, Russian speaking parts at somehow uh, at odds with Ukraine's Ukrainian speaking uh, parts. This notion of a uh, Ukrainian speaking uh, Western EU um, a half of the country somehow not quite agreeing with a Russian speaking Russian leaning half of the country. This is a major myth that is taken some time to uh, debunk, to unpack, and to explore, which is what we uh, have tried to do in a variety of different publications and conferences that have has sought to restore a view, actually, of Ukraine as a wonderfully multilingual place, one that now features, for instance, a president who is a Russian-speaking former comedian um, uh, of uh, Jewish uh, extraction, who is regularly now, as he reports to his people about the attacks on his country, <clears throat> is using both Ukrainian and Russian interchangeably, sentence after sentence. He'll begin in Ukrainian, um, he'll then uh, reach out in Russian, uh, and then go back to Ukrainian and sometimes uh, use English as well. So this is a very common experience uh, for many Ukrainians, but it was something that the West failed to understand completely. And certainly, uh, as I mentioned at the start, the Kremlin sought to um, uh, inject with this kind of sinister meaning. So in many respects, this conflict is brought on by a politics of antipathy to the very idea of multilingualism itself. <clears throat> the um, other issue that we contended with was once you begin to debunk these myths about linguistic diversity as adversity, you have to contend with this notion that somehow the language you speak determines who you are and what person you vote for and what kind of civilization you wish to, 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 to pursue. Um, this has also been something, uh, as I mentioned before, that um, has, has hung on in Western scholarship. And as my colleagues in the project, and particularly in my engagements with um, our colleagues in the, the Catalan context, as well as with Ivan Kozachenko, our sociologist, we began to really see um, an analytical failure that rested largely in our blindness to culture and to cultural texts, to close readings of cultural texts that spoke to um, the lives of everyday individual Ukrainians. Um, so we decided to use this as a really important case study. And we also sought to explore what we call territorialist discourse um, in a study like uh, Ukraine. That is a place um, that, as I mentioned before, is linguistically diverse, has a very complicated uh, linguistic uh, landscape, but one that's been studied um, with this preference for elevating and privileging the variable of space. So uh, a region, a macro region, elevating those things with anal analytical privilege over others. And so we explored this territorialist discourse, linked it back to, frankly, a residue of imperial thinking uh, with respect to Ukraine. So in, in the work that we did, we uh, confronted these and targeted these particular issues, both again in Western scholarship and in, in, in Russian discourse about the country. And this brings me to um, the role of culture because uh, culture, as we all know, the study of modern languages offer us remarkable insights into the complicated individual lives of subjects in the world. If we're studying populations in the abstract and we're placing people in, in columns and um, uh, cells on spreadsheets and we're looking at polling data and we're looking at numbers, we fail to see how, particularly in the case of a Ukrainian citizen, one begins the morning in Russian, continues at work in Ukrainian, perhaps uses a bit of Polish, uh, steps back and uses English as well. Texts, films, poems, all of these texts, when we read them closely, showcase how this multilingual life is, is, is extremely vibrant and extremely evident. And so our focus was very much on foregrounding those kinds of texts. And then at the same time, trying to explore what they're doing at a time of war. So uh, when Yvonne and I were writing um, a, a piece with, uh, with Wendy and Linda um, about interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary approaches to multilingualism, we were looking at the consequences of a war in occupied Eastern Ukraine. As we all have seen, um, Russia has invaded uh, further attacking the country all across the country. Um, the the, the, um, 
the, uh, the pretense of any kind of specific uh, intervention in Eastern Ukraine about Russian speakers has completely now uh, been thrown out the window. So uh, our thesis, however, about cultural producers, quote unquote, and it's not the greatest term, frankly, we, we struggled with it, um, but we did want to include not only people who are uh, artists, writers, and poets, and filmmakers, but those who promote their work, distribute their work, and how they see that work of, of multilingual culture in Ukraine. And what we saw was there were some um, marginal uh, groups and actors in Ukraine's cultural space that saw um, Ukrainian language work needed to be promoted at the expense of Russian. So there was a little uh, bit of an anti-colonial, let's say, perspective with respect to the Russian language. But the predominant mainstream was an openness to all these languages with a privileging of Ukrainian. And this was held across the country in a variety of different uh, contexts, filmmakers, uh, writers, and musicians. Um, and in these multilingual texts, we see a lot of meditations on war. And those meditations on war frankly surprised us because my own intuition was naturally war as Chris Hedges once observed, uh, it makes the world understandable as a black and white tableau of, M, of them versus us, right? So a, a war that suspends thought, particularly self-critical thought. And what these cultural texts showed us by way of close reading is the opposite, in fact. So these Ukrainian artists using multilingualism in their texts while privileging at the same time Ukrainian we're upending these black and white tableaux. We're pushing back against um, views by other Ukrainian writers who've perhaps dismissed Russian speaking members of Eastern Ukraine as not like us at all. So that was a view that was quite marginal. But on the whole, um, the cultural actors in Ukraine today were not policing these boundaries of a national we. Um, they were rather taking pains to question the boundaries of national belonging itself. So in that space of multilingualism, in the cultural context, we were seeing a flowering of open, tolerant, um, accepting discourse. And it's one of these things, of course, you can't see um, in the aggregate when you're looking at a country by way of uh, disciplines like international relations or political science or sociology even, um, humanities-led approach um, in concert with these different approaches to studying massive countries like Ukraine show us um, the depth and diversity and the life of many languages in, in, in one subject's worldview. So that was very critical to us. Um, and I will um, just conclude with, I think, a, a reference to the um, implications for nationalism studies. Because one of the things that we did is we studied a great deal of poetry and prose. And what we see is um, in nationalism studies, when one talks about literature, one is usually talking about narrative. Uh, stories of the nation, stories we tell ourselves in belonging to the nation. Um, the texts that we looked at often didn't advance stories and narratives per se. They engaged in a kind of lyricism in which different subject voices, um, often underspecified, a contextual, were speaking across different gaps and interstices about their belonging um, in no conclusive um, teleological terms at all. So that was one way we, we sought to, I think, um, offer a small intervention in nationalism studies. So I think I've come to the end of my few minutes. Um, uh, so I'll move on to Wendy. Okay, I'm, I'm very conscious that time is against us, but I just want to pull a couple of ideas together on a, two final slides. Um, now, I think we were very keen that we wanted to respect disciplinary conventions and that all the interdisciplinary working was bottom up. But we did find that working together as an interdisciplinary team did give us deeper understanding. And these just refer to those three research questions. So we constantly came back to the complexity of the relationship between the individual and society, the benefits of moving from the perspective of society and nation to the individual and their life lived experience, and then move away from simple associations, as we've heard, like simple association of language with territories, nations, and ethnicities. We found that the challenges and opportunities, perhaps unsurprisingly, often, often mirror each other. And there's a complexity of the relationship between multilingualism, identity, and diversity. And what was interesting for me was that even for the cognitive scientists, they agreed with us that multilingual identity is complex, fluid, and subjective. The juxtaposition of the different languages, they let us broaden out our perspective 
but that does have, as we've kind of heard on a number of occasions today, implications for our institutional structures and what it means to be a modern linguist. And then finally, I wanted to say that, okay, you might all be thinking, yes, but fine, multilingualism is a topic which lends itself to interdisciplinary approach and work on a range of languages. But it's easy to think of a whole range of other uh, major issues of our time to which modern languages is centrally placed to contribute. Um, modern slavery, the promotion of global Britain in inverted commas, uh, removal of inequalities, legacy of empire, and, 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 and so on. And indeed, we might say it's perhaps particularly where the issues are most controversial and painful have been swept metaphorically under the political carpet, that analysis of the works of culture and literature in different languages and produced in different times has something powerful to say. So I'm going to stop uh, there and um, we'd be very happy, I think, to try and answer any questions that people might have. Many thanks, Wendy. Uh, thanks to Rory and Mihal as well. Uh, absolutely fantastic session. Um, and just to, to echo what Hilary Footit has said um, in the chat, and I'd like to pay tribute to, to Hilary, who's pioneering AHRC funded work on languages and, and, and war, very much echoes um, a, a, a number of the, the uh, strands coming out of the Aori work. Um, but what a brilliant illustration of um, interdisciplinary work where modern languages are not playing an ornamental function, but are actually driving. Um, driving the work. And I agree with Hilary that there are examples um, in looking at the Global Challenge Research Fund um, of, of modern languages uh, driven work there as well. So re thank you all three of you. We've got a couple of minutes for any um, observations or any questions that uh, colleagues would, would like to raise and, and pose to, to Wendy, Rory or Michal. Wendy, can I, can I come in? Um, I've got a broad question about um, policy making and persuading um, policy makers uh, of the, the benefits, not of language informed policy making, but actually of language driven policy making. I wondered if, if, if you had any thoughts on that in relation to, to, the, to the, the case study we've just been talking about or more broadly. So I think it's um, a slow burn process. You know, I've been doing a lot of policy work and actually a um, lot of it with Janice as, as you know and one of the things that we did was a training session for policy leaders in uh, in, in Northern Ireland. Um, it's it's easier to get into the devolved administrations than it is to get into to Westminster I'd say although we do have now two posts devoted to languages in Whitehall, one in GCHQ and one in the Cabinet Office, so that's a huge step forward. Um, but one of the things that Janice and I did was to uh, train people in, in different departments in NI, um, just to have that reflex to think, might there be a languages dimension to my um, portfolio? So that just as now people are used to thinking, is there a gender dimension, is there an ethnic dimension? that they, they just have that reflex. And it was very interesting because a lot of them, I think, initially didn't think they had. Um, but at the end, you know, we hopefully were convinced, that, and I mean, the feedback said, you know, that they, that they could see that there was a languages dimension. And, um, you know, I, one of the stories, I'm, I'm, people have heard this a lot, but for those who haven't, you know, one of the stories I always tell in this context is when I first... Um, met the permanent secretary for, from the MOJ, who's not there anymore, um, asked him, um, I want, said I wanted to speak to somebody in the MOJ, Minister of Justice, who did something on languages. And his first reaction is the standard reaction across government is, I don't think we do languages in the MOJ. And he very quickly then, I mean, said, oh, okay, right, well, I've been to a prison and they were talking about the fact that the prison population is quite multilingual. Is that the kind of thing you're talking about? So one of the problems is that people don't conceive their portfolios as having a languages dimension. Yeah. And one of the things that I and others have tried to do is to get into government and just get that reflex. Yeah. And I think when we get begin to get that reflex, that might begin to change yeah. things gradually. And just one final thought is I think 
it, it's very, very important not to just think about languages as being part of the DfE, Department yeah. for Education. They often feel, I think, very beleaguered that we as academics are constantly on their back, constantly challenging them and, and all the rest of it. And if we can spread the feeling that languages are everywhere, then one of the things that I've, I've written about is how languages are everywhere and nowhere in government, yeah. right? You know, that, that there's not this acceptance of language. If we could spread the, 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 the interest in languages, that would also help the yeah. DfE actually in, yeah. in a way. Yeah, that's, no, that's a really helpful set of observations. Thanks, Wendy. Steve, do you want to come in briefly? Uh, yeah, I was just going to reinforce a couple of the points that Rory was making. As you can imagine, that this situation is playing on my mind as uh, as it is on his. Uh, but in the context of re of um, you, you know stressing the need for and the value of modern languages expertise, uh, it, it strikes me the, the the sort of laxity and looseness with which our own press and journalists cast around terms to refer to um, uh, uh, Russian speakers, ethnic Russians, Russian citizens, the, 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 these terms are kind of used interchangeably mm. um, in a way that, 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 that they really shouldn't. And, 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 and it really does require someone who knows the, yeah. uh, the situation and the, and the language and the terms used in their original to, to point this sort of thing out. And, and, and the other thing, I, I, I mean, I don't know whether Rory um, could, uh, um, suffered through Putin's sort of insane rant on, on, on Monday evening. I, I, I switched off after 20 minutes. I could take no more. But one thing that struck me was, was the, the sort of terminology he was using was sort of an ethno-cultural, ethno-linguistic, ethno-nationalist and imperial language that, that 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 was just so extreme uh, that you know it was at that point that i that i be, be became really alarmed now the point is that what he that was a very very extreme version of of a sort of an approach to nationhood that we're not completely free of here um and it would be a lesson you know to 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 to, to put putin's speech translated if, and, and 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 to use it as a tool with which to get at these um issues that we too are not yeah. entirely free of. i mean as it happens i'm 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 uh, i've been invited to go and speak to the um dcms um on on uh, in a couple of weeks time um and um i i think i'm going to use it in part as a platform to you know to stress that 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 that, that, that we need yeah. that people who know the, the the region and the language and the culture mm -hmm. in order to get our own our own policy making um uh right and we've you know we've failed yeah. in many ways in my views dismally in uh, over this issue and others yeah that's really steve uh, that's really helpful that, that, and uh, I think that that's the, what you're describing there, particularly around ethno-linguistic nationalism, is true mm. in a number of the contexts in which, mm. in which we operate. Excellent. Mm. But th thank you very much um, again to Wendy, Rory and, and Mihal. Let, let's move on now to um, the interventions from um, language acts and world making. I'm going to hand over immediately to, to Catherine Boyle, Catherine, who was, who was PI, um, but Renata Brandau and, and Rachel Scott are going to speak too. But Catherine, over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for that session. I sort of really want to carry on with that. And we're going to take a bit of a, a, a swerve in another direction, but I hope there are connections here as well. I can't see Renata and Rachel, but I'd really like to see you on screen. To have you. Great. Thank you very much. Just to have you there with me uh, just now. Thank you. I'm going to read and that helps also with time. And uh, I'm just trying to get some of these ideas down in, in as uh, synthetic a way as possible. And also, um, that's not the right word. Anyway, um, and also to give Renata and Rachel a chance to speak. Um, and also we'll make some connections. So in this presentation, Rachel Scott and Renata Brandau, who are both postdoctoral researchers on language acts and world making, and I will speak about the place and impact of funding. We're going to present some ideas and aspects of how language acts and world making responded to a specific call and worked from a research base to contribute to the future strength and uh, of the discipline 
and to create communities that seek to enhance language research and learning in the future. One question is how we sustain this model of funding to make any progress sustainable and productive. That question has come up already and, and the fellows started to address that uh, today as other people did. The connection between research and funding can be fraught, especially as the difference between funded and non-funded research becomes written into our university research or structures around arts and humanities. The Aori project was written by the HRC as a challenge to the modern languages community. It was a provocation to us to demonstrate that we could make good, make good use of up to 20 million pounds of funding and was undoubtedly to be understood as a sort of last chance to save the discipline in the context of the research councils and our place within universities in the crisis we've narrated often to our detriment, as people said before, for so long. This was a chance to turn away from the narrative of deficit. So I've got two articulations of the challenge that I'm going to present in approximately four minutes. Um, articulation one is, what can research do? Implicit in the hourly call is the need to make the research we're already doing speak to and act within the aims of the broader project. This is one of the challenges about this type of call that pulls us into the questioning of the nature of the research in which we engage. I think the last panel showed brilliantly what that can actually do. For example, where does the work of the lone scholar figure? When the call was, as we understood it, essentially about forms of activism in modern languages, the questions uh, would seem to be about how to make our research resonate in this context of having a transformative impact, in the words of our, our recall, on the discipline. But research, and I'm, I'm talking here about language acts, but this range is mirrored across all the Auri projects. So research that ranged from the study of Al-Andalus to medieval literature, historical and descriptive linguistics, translation theory and practice, pedagogy and digital humanities all came together and contributed to the creation of communities that will sustain us, I think, through research, teaching and curriculum development, the creation of new networks and the nurturing and mentoring of PhD and postdoctoral researchers. And we can discuss details in the conversation if you want. So the key here, I think, is trusting the force of modern languages, arts and humanities research as worthwhile impact in the very best sense of the words, as Antonio Machado would say. Articulation two is about the types of models of funding, or I've called it internal models of funding, but that's not the correct uh, term, but we'll leave it like that just now. Uh, the creation of community was important to us uh, across the Aurie projects, and here I'm talking specifically about language acts. Central to the projects was the flexible funding strain of, of Aurie, which provided funds to each one of the projects every year to develop the scope of their research. In this way, all Aurie projects engaged with a wide community of researchers and partners. In language acts, we created a small grant scheme for projects of between 500 and 1500 pounds. And through the scheme, we, handed, we funded 109 projects nationally and internationally. And we became part of a wider community, changing the shape of our place in the discussions. By that, I mean that our research may have lain at the heart of facilitating the projects through the immense privilege of having funded the funding that allowed us to offer material contribution to a wide range of research and practice-based endeavours. But more importantly, it decentered us, proposing different and opposing perspectives on our research and work within the academy. This model, this small grants model, was one which in our final report to the HRC, we asked the HRC UKRI to emulate. The UCML is already doing this. This is because of the transformative impact of, firstly, the agility of the funding, and secondly, what we learned from it and the impact that it had on our research and, and thinking. Through the grant scheme, we've been introduced to innovative, consistently thought-provoking work, 
which helps us to meet our core objectives while offering welcome challenges. It also helps us to create a sense of what core researchers beyond the academy uh, do for us and, and to, to broaden a, a deep sense of what research is. And these challenges that were brought to us, for example, enhancing inclusion and diversity in language teaching and learning, identifying emerging research fields that might not be in the academy yet, and new communities of study, enacting social, inju- social justice, for example, all help us articulate our own position in the field. And I think this is part of, firstly, how we bring the type of research carried out in these rarefied environments into our institutions and classrooms. And secondly, how we create models of funding that allow a broad research, a range of research initiatives and, and really speak for the immense value of the research that we're doing, again, has been shown across the, all of the panels um, today. So I'm going to pass to Renata first and then to Rachel. And we wanted Renata and Rachel really to talk about what it was like being part of a, a research uh, a project like the early projects as early career academics and what they will now bring into, um, into their careers, but also into their thinking about research and funding. And we're going to go to Renata first. Thank you very much for your listening. There you go. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> uh, also, I have just realized that my question there makes it sound as almost as if I have developed a sudden identity crisis, which I guess um, on this Friday, after such a long week, I suppose is actually quite appropriate for all of us to ask why are we here. But uh, yes, I was a postdoc at the Digital Mediation Strand at Language Acts and Rulemaking, and I'm currently a lecturer in multimedia journalism at the School of Arts and Creative Industries at the University of East London. But really, when I think about about this topic, about this this idea of research and funding, I think that at least my talk needs to start a little bit uh, early on in quite a few years back, because as an international student coming from a developing country, I know that uh, without the various fundings, the various grants that I have been received over the years, I would just not be here. Uh, when we, um, and when I say we is the big we, international researchers, when we come to, to study in institutions abroad, we, we do so with the full intention and uh, hoping that we're going to be able to devote all of our energy on all of our time to, to develop our academic success. And we know that, unfortunately, that's not always the case. Uh, a number of researchers, and when I say here, especially international researchers, but we know that it's not just international researchers, we often have to work part-time to have the means to actually devote to this academic success. Uh, I was lucky enough that during my BA and I, my AMA, I received scholarships, and it was a grant from the National Council for Scientific and Technological Development from Brazil that enabled me to pursue my PhD, essentially. And it was my PhD that set me on this path to, you know, to demonstrate how digital data enhances and expands research, uh, modern language research in this case, and how it develops in meaningful, creative, and accessible ways. And if this was to me, at least the beginning of the process, it was really my work in language acts and world making that cemented this path. Um, with, With this extensive research interest of the project team, and the collaboration opportunities that we have developed over the years, uh, it's it's clear that Language Acts and Auri have informed the next steps of my career. And in fact, it has it has informed all the future steps that I'm going to move forward because you know we are not um, we're not an island. 
And to me, language acts and open world research initiative has served as this almost this laboratory in which we um, have been able to to explore to experiment with this the various intersections of our research and with that we begin to develop new projects together and it is kind of in this context that two two big projects have emerged and two projects that have played an important role in this next stage of of my career uh, one of them came straight from precisely this, this this laboratory, this intersection of of the of the various researches, um, where Dr. Sophie Stevens, who was a postdoc at the Translation Act Strand, and I, we were awarded the King's Interdisciplinary Curriculum Innovation Award to create a new final year module named Art and Activism in the Digital Age, and that came. Uh, directly and it was based on our research as part of language acts and world making the project or, or if language acts recognize this potential and uh of breaking down this traditional disciplinary approaches sophie and i kind of brought this even uh, you know brought even further and as we advocated for it, this interdisciplinary and multimodal uh, classroom where the students were really seen as co-creators. So their 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 assessments, their um, their their work was seen as something they they would create it with us. And thanks to this funding, we were able to envision this multilingual environment in which students were able to encounter material from different places and be able to share with each other the the various um spaces of art that uh, that exist around the world and the importance of it in in terms of language we were uh in the midst of writing our chapter for the language acts debate um book when the, the pandemic happened and with pandemic happened another project uh came to to light as uh, language acts was quite fast in responding and in reacting really to this understanding that this global response to the pandemic is very much informed by language, by the language that we use to describe it. And as such, the, the project for making in the time of COVID-19 sought to explore this uh the, the global narratives of the virus. And the project was developed as a direct response of the rapid response to COVID-19, a grant from King's, again, that essentially uh, envisioned to bring cutting edge research to bear on the various challenges created by COVID-19, as, and as we know, there were many. Um, in total, we looked at over 1.1 million um, newspaper articles in 12 different languages covering um, over 117 countries. We have we have put together a podcast with four episodes, which uh, as of today or this morning, we had over 800 unique listeners. So, and this project has also been infused into a open university course on language in times of crisis which is going to be available later this summer. So all of this has been really just, um, you know, the, the beginning of a lot of other ideas and, and research to come. But I don't want to take uh, Rachel's time, and I like to always take time to, to, to have my time uh, quite, um, you know, spot on, on the five minutes in this case. But I, I cannot finish this without saying that you know, Rachel and I are kind of in the minority minority here um, as early career researchers. We are permanent member of staffs now, and with that comes obviously obviously some benefits both in terms of funding and opportunities. And I cannot leave here without taking note that the reality is that most women early career researchers work part time and they are on contract basis for funding. It's not just important, 
but it's very much essential uh, and absolutely critical for them to continue and to develop the, their career. So that's me. I hope I did not take any of your time, Rachel. <laughs> Not at all, Renata. Thank you as well for those really pertinent um, points at the very end. I'll just get my PowerPoint up. So, yeah, so I, like Renata, I'm sort of connecting the dots between what I've done with language acts and world making, where I am now, and um, the role that funding has had in my research on that journey. So I was a postdoctoral researcher on the traveling concept strand of language acts and world making. And in 2020, I was fortunate enough to get a permanent position as lecturer in world and Hispanic literatures at Royal Holloway, the University of London. And I would say that being part of Aori and language acts has been fundamental to my career success so far. Um, and I think especially the experience of teaching in a department like King's where Hispanic studies or literatures in general, languages in general taught from a global perspective has been very informative um, and had a huge impact on my career development and the way and how I research. And particularly a pro as a project language acts, um, rethinking what modern languages is, and how it intersects with related disciplines like comparative literature, like world literature, which is now part of my job. Um, you know, I have a dual position in Hispanic studies and comp lit and world lit. Um, but I think more importantly to today, or more relevant to today, being part of Aria and Language Acts has really given me the experiences necessary to have success in funding applications. Um, and I would say, and that is due in part uh, to the enormous support of the colleagues that I worked with and the fantastic team that we had on language acts and the really innovative thinking that that, that we had access to there. So I'm going to say a little bit about my research just to show how um, my, you know, what my approach to my research is because, and I think it's important to do that because what I research and how I research um, and the research that I've done as part of language access and world making has been, you know, really fundamentally interwoven with the funding that I've received and applied for. So um, my focus has been on reception and cultural translation on the worldliness of early literatures and also literature as a form of world making. And I take uh, an, a non-Eurocentric view of modern languages and language dependent cultures. So I focus on um, interactions with literatures in Arabic, Hebrew, Turkish, Persian, Sanskrit. So basically very comparative and transnational in view, putting Spain in its global context, you know, really recognizing that um, the medieval and early modern worlds were multilingual and were plural in and of themselves. Um, and also really focusing on the relevance of earlier literatures and cultures to the contemporary world. And this is something that is, is really formed a, a central part to the funding that I've gained and, and the sort of work that I've done across and beyond the academy. Um, and I suppose the funding, um, the funding that I've gained, well, while I was a postdoc on language acts, I applied for several smaller funds um, to, to, uh, to fund public engagement activities with schools in the cultural sector. And the first two were smaller internal grants to King's College London. And these led to the development of applications for bigger external funding. So one, thank you very much UCML uh, through their small grant scheme. And also in um, earlier last year, actually, uh, I and a team of curators that I'm working with were fortunate to receive uh, 25,000 pounds from Arts Council England for um, a public engagement project, a creative project that engages with languages and language dependent cultures. And all of these um, funds have really hinged around the research that I was doing and am doing for and as part of language acts and, and while making and that really sought to create relationships with sectors and audiences beyond the academy. Um, so opening up engagement with uh, languages, literatures and cultures more broadly. 
And I'll, I'll say just a couple of things about the ACE funded collaboration um, that was also funded by Language Acts as well, of course. Um, and it was one of the uh, outputs, intended outputs of, of the Language Arts project. Um, and it's a partnership with a wonderful gallery in King's Cross called the P21. And um, the funding has enabled us, will enable us to do later this year, a live exhibition and public events program um, feature featuring UK and international artists and community organisations and, and schools as well. And this is based around exploring the idea of stories as um, sort of shared cultural heritage, exploring the, the interlingual and intercultural exchange of them, how they're translated between languages, cultures, times and places, and, and particular themes um, of identity, migration, otherness, belonging, um, as well as looking at how um, how people's so trying to get the participating artists and community groups and audiences in reflecting on the way that they live and move through the world and navigate to the borders of languages, you know, navigating between languages, places, um, and cultures. And, um, and so languages and language dependent cultures, particularly those from Arabic and um, Eastern cultures has been fundamental to this project as well in the way that they've engaged with European, um, European languages and cultures. And I suppose I, I will keep it, I'm keeping it very brief so that we can you know, have time to chat, but I have a few concluding thoughts, some of which chime with what Renata has said already, that um, as an ECR, funding has been you know, fundamental and utterly necessary for our career progression as a marker of success, for example. But for me, um, funding has also been central in a, a perhaps a more deeper way. Um, and it's allowed me to promote engagement with and the relevance of languages and literatures and especially those of earlier periods beyond the academy and when I say sort of relevance I'm not only thinking of in terms of a very um, ref strategic sense of impact and relevance but relevance because languages as we all know here I'm speaking to a convert to the converted here you know they are enriching and also because understanding the past its plurality and its heterogeneity it's perhaps more important than ever. Um, and I suppose my two final points are that I have benefited from smaller grants that have allowed me to build up experience and, and test ideas. Um, and I would, like Renata has already done, I would urge funding bodies and associations and research councils to maintain these smaller pots of money um, alongside the obvious bigger prestige funds, because I think that they're vital for not only ECRs, but scholars of all levels of, of career experience, because I think that they show that it is possible to do valuable work that furthers research and interest in modern languages and, and other cultures and literatures, even on a smaller scale. So that, like Renata's, would be, would be my takeaway point. Um, and also, I think that the ACE funding is... Uh, important because it recognises the importance of languages and literatures to the cultural life of the UK more broadly, um, to the fact that it's important to shed and uh, to reach out to wider audiences and it's it's allowed us to shed new light on on um, texts from outside of Europe in a very plural interdisciplinary way that's had a very profound way, uh, profound impact on how I research and, and also what I research and what I'm thinking about doing um, in as my career progresses as well. So they would be my takeaway points and I will leave it there so we have time for, um, for discussion. That's excellent. Thanks ever so much, Rachel. What, what a remarkably powerful session we've just heard across the two um, projects but many thanks to, to Catherine Renata and Rachel for talking there about um, language acts what I really appreciated was was the, the clear resonance across the two sets of presentations there because particularly when Renata was talking about the the incredible um, work that language acts did um, around uh, the early the early months of, of covid 19 um clearly there we're thinking about responses to to key issues um, of of our time. Um, I pick up entirely on, on what Rachel said at the end there. There is 
a pressing need for institutions, whether they're our own employers or whether they're funders, to acknowledge the need for, for a um, broad ecosystem of grants, which encompasses large grants, which as we've seen are transformational, but also small grants, which allow the types of interdisciplinary entrepreneur, entrepreneurialism that, um, that, that Rachel, talk, Rachel talked about. And just, I think in terms of moving to, to the conclusions, the, the Language Act's message around building community, thinking about relationships to community, um, are, are so important. And what, what I liked about um, what we've just heard is that sense of, of an embodied legacy of, of Aori as well, the way in which, um, and we don't always acknowledge this, um, that the, these projects can, can change us individually as researchers. They can be um, definitive, they can be foundational, they can, um, for the, the, they can either accompany us through a career or um, those who are mid or, mid or later career, it can actually be a, a tipping point, to change of new direction. So absolutely um, fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Charles, um, who will um, chair the Q&A and observations and discussions of the language acts and world making um, interventions there and lead into um, the conclusions, but many thanks. Thank you very much, Charles. I'll just, Charles has to, to go. Um, um, I'll just take over for um, questions on this final part of what has been, as Charles said, an exceptionally powerful session. So questions too. Um, I see that Naomi, you've raised your hand. Uh, yeah, I just want to say really, really valuable kind of th throughout these presentations, really interesting. I'm just kind of returning to Renata's point, which is about this very, which I think, you know, we all have to have at the forefront of our minds is about precarity and how important that is in terms of sustainability. And that is the key, you know, sustainability, a lot of it's about people. And we need to remember not just resources. If the people aren't there who created those resources, they will not really have that impact. So I think the one issue kind of with the small grants is often they don't cover research at time. And what is valuable about these huge grants is, you know, I personally, you know, got quite a long <laughs> you know, salary, basically, for three and a half years to think of it in quite, you know, concrete terms. Um, and so I guess the question it's, I know it's a, one we're all grappling with is what, what do we say to the research council funders about? I personally think going from PhD into a long postdoc and then to lecturer is actually a wonderful way to build your research career, but it's that it doesn't happen for most people that smoothly. Um, so I just, I, I don't know the answer, but if anyone has any ideas of what we tell the research councils, how the research councils and universities work to make this a sustainable career development, I just, yeah, as I say, I don't have the answer. So sorry to throw it to you. These, these are massive questions, um, but they're extremely important questions. So um, Rachel, Renata, Catherine. I, mean, I, I think one answer before, uh, Renata and Rachel come in is you've given it yourself, Naomi. And I see, you know, there's the other PIs here and there's other people in the meeting today who have had large grants. But the answer is the importance of this type of funding for precisely what you've, you've done, because you can um, create the possibility for postdoctoral researchers and, uh, and you can put an emphasis on that if you want. And that was one of the things that's been really important, I think, across all the uh, our projects. Um, Janice might have a better idea. I can't remember all the figures, but if you think of all the postdoctoral researchers and where they've they've gone to, it's quite uh, significant. And that's why we wanted to concentrate uh, our thoughts on that just now and and show two examples of research trajectory. And being absolutely aware, especially when we're in the middle of industry action for this, you know, of the precarious nature of. Thank you, Janice, for our two postdocs. Of course, I. Um, you know, in the middle of uh, industrial action, action because of this, but especially in terms of the precarious nature of the research. I also take your point about small grants. I think, uh, back to, to Rachel's point at the end, having this different, this, this um, was uh, Charles, you might have called it that, Rachel as well, but this sort of ecosystem of, of different grants. The power of smaller grants is, uh, well, is this a seed funding as being able to show uh, to prove something, to test something, to start making networks, to start doing that sort of, of um, 
research work, which isn't necessarily about the production of outputs, but is about the creation of networks, the creation of the development of your own thinking. And that's the power of those sorts of grants and having that agility and funding, I think, can help in, in certain ways. So I think having a, a, a system that works in, in both ways is really important. And the, third, the next thing I would say to that is the role that we all have in, in universities and as either middle or senior managers to recognise the work of postdoctoral researchers and early career researchers and to be able to recognise the breadth of research experience they bring that you, everyone brings to roles and not just to be guided by, for example, uh, you know, can somebody immediately uh, contribute to REF, for example. I think the, the, the naming of research, the naming of research outputs and the naming of the work that early career uh, academics do through this system has got to be brought into the universities and institutions in that context as well. And I think that's where you begin to get uh, the sort of sustainability we've been trying to underline there. So that's my response in the first instance, Naomi, which um, I come as no surprise. I don't know if Renata or Rachel mm. want to say something. There. And I can see there's things in the chat. Mm. Yeah. Rachel or Renata, do you want to come in on that? or? Um, I suppose the only point I have is please carry on providing postdoctoral <laughs> funding. Exactly. You know, please, please do prioritise it alongside the, the more prestigious funds for, for scholars who are further along in their careers. It has to be the only, it's the only way that we will continue to see growth and sustainability of, of staff, of, of researchers and ultimately of our discipline. I don't see how there's any other way, really. It's how you get people in and, and give them the support to, to launch their careers. Yeah, Renata? I think there's little to, 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 to add here because it's such, a, it, it's such an important question and to me it's a question as well that does not have an easy answer, right? It's, it's one that is going to take, it's going to take all of us to, actively think about this as we move forward with, with, with whichever funding or research we're doing that, that you know, it, and then slowly changing. But um, yeah, I like you, I, I don't think I have a good answer to that, Naomi. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I think we can look at uh, Emmanuel's question is, how, we can, how can we ensure graduates of less prestigious institutions get access to funding or are trained as part of networks hosted at top research universities? That is, a, as Hilary says, that is a key question. Um, and that's one thing I think that um, certainly one response would be, well, that can be built into the nature of funding calls that really should be collaborations between various institutes uh, with opportunities at all levels. Um, but there are there, there, there's more to say about that. So if people want to come in to again, I'd be I'd be really interested to hear what other people have to say about this. I mean, one thing I would say about uh, about that is when we advertised for the postdoctoral researchers, it was a very broad uh, advertisement, you know, and, and people came from different backgrounds to to language acts, for example, and I'm sure that's that's true of other our projects as well. There, we can't get away from the fact that, that yeah, there's uh, prestige universities and in in inverted commas, the ones who have uh, can, can create the the funding, the types of funding that we've been able to have access to. That's it's a huge uh, huge privilege, and it does undoubtedly create um, inequalities across the sector. We we can't get away from that. But that's where I think these sort of different. Uh, uh, system of, of grants and, and think what you're saying Char Charles about the types of ways that we can create uh, links across um, across different institutions is is really important. I think when you look at the range of uh, institutions and groups and partnerships that the Ari collective engage with it's pretty huge actually you know so so there is something there that is happening. Uh, about developing different types of researchers. And that's why we keep going back to the small grants for us, because they were so important in, um, in developing uh, core researchers amongst the types of groups that we were hearing about earlier on in the, in, um, 
in the day as well as in, in academic circles as well. I mean, I, I think Emmanuel's point is really important. And I think it is the way that we have to, we have to do a lot of work in, in this uh, sense. And I think obviously, you, uh, you know, IMLR, different institutions like that are really important in that sense. How do we create types of groups and consortia, whatever they have to be, to, uh, to share these, these research riches? I think um, an inbuilt, there is, a, I mean, I can't, can't deny there's inbuilt inequality, you know, the types of research space that you might get, the types of research support that you might get in, in research intensive universities, but well, not the same in, in other universities. But I think there's a, there's a, a level of um, sharing if, of all sorts it, that we can do in all sorts of ways. And I would really like to see that as part of a, a strategy that we can pick up, up on now across the different institutions and, uh, and networks and associations that, that represent our discipline. Thank you, Catherine. I think, yeah, well, obviously, if there are other questions for um, Catherine, Rachel and Renata, we'll come back to that. But what we might do is, is sort of fluidly move into the final concluding session. Um, and which will we'll end about you know, half past four or shortly after that, um, just to try to, to tie some of these um, points that have been made throughout the day um, and with, with many powerful interventions. Um, and just really thinking about what action points one can take from a very condensed um, session of this kind in which we're really trying to think strategically. I think very, and I'm going to invite Emma Cayley the chair of UCML to, to join me in this final um, concluding session, really to think about, well, some of the points that have been raised and where we can go with these. And I think just to take that up that point, Catherine, I think uh, an institution like the IMLR has a massive role to play as brokering, convening, and really um, pursuing an idea of a very joined up institutional approach to the disciplinary area and assuring that and ensuring that these um, these connections are made. Um, yeah, Naomi, do you want to make that point um, verbally? Yeah, I did, I'd just say that um, the, the HRC is consulting on their doctoral training partnerships. And I do think there is a question about how those training partnerships concentrate training in certain institutions, students already with funding, you know, there are I think there are ways that they could create a more inclusive um, model um, of funding there. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I mean, there is a certain, uh, we do have a certain lobbying power. Uh, and I think, for example, the British Academy is extremely active in this, in making sure that various elements of the disciplinary structure are heard and that we, that we do push um, this kind of intervention very strongly. I wonder if we could use this space to reflect also more generally about some of the, the very many points that have been made about um, uh, the disciplinary area, where we go from here, and with very real purpose, considering um, uh, what is happening in the immediate environment, let alone uh, what is happening in uh, the world. Um, I sort of jotted down 17 questions. I think we might get through one or two. Um, one of them that we might reflect upon, thinking about the different um, sessions, is this the question about community uh, and modern languages, uh, how we call ourselves and how we think of ourselves. There is, as I say, the IMLR is considering changing its name to better reflect the disciplinary area that it uh, covers. There is a question. Um, that has been raised implicitly and explicitly in a number of interventions today as to whether modern languages re really does say literally or explicitly what we do. And if there is a moment of subject benchmarking when we are, and that is called languages, societies and cultures, whether that might be a better way of talking about the disciplinary area and indeed, a very strong set throughout the day to be talking about a holistic model that is, of course, open to very different interpretations, but which 
nevertheless is identifiable um, uh, and present where it needs to be. Uh, Stephen Hutchins gave the example of history. Yes, uh, uh, and it's absolutely true. Of course, history has its uh, many different uh, parts. It has many different questions about its identity. Its great strength is that it's immediately understandable. It can speak directly to, to, to Whitehall, the public, get history. And I think it, there's a certain amount of work to, to be done about um, making sure that the space and its diversity and heterogeneity is understood, but understood um, perhaps more immediately than is presently the case. So perhaps we could talk a little bit about whether we want to uh, pursue that. That would be one question. Sorry. Um, I know I wanted to pick up on Rajinda's uh, point, but, but sorry, you have to leave. So that is a question. Do you want to come in there, Emma? Um, yeah, I was just going to say it, it's a it's a difficult one, isn't it? Obviously, as you've said, IMLR are, are thinking possibly about the the name change, and and I know you and I have talked about it for UCML as well. Um, you know, it, I suppose I suppose there's the worry, isn't there, about the pipeline and and sort of breaking that link between you know how how languages is understood at school level and and how it's understood um, beyond that in the community and that's that's one issue which i i don't know whether we've quite resolved or whether anyone has any thoughts about i mean in terms of visibility for funding as well that's uh, i think that's one thing that i was chatting to neil kenny about at some point i don't know whether he's on the he's on the call or not can i come in there just to say something if you don't mind I was just thinking um, that listening today and thinking about the work that we've done, I feel as if university, we've got to catch up with what's happening beyond the community. I mean, the work that, of, of, you know, in multilingualism, the work that we're hearing about this morning in schools, that uh, the work that, that people were talking about with, the, with home languages and all sorts of things, you know, I feel as if we might be. Um, restraining ourselves in that sense, you know, being, if we do have a reluctance to, uh, uh, to, to change, but you listen, but all the work that we've done and the, all the grant, the, the small grants just shows it's enormous amounts of work being happening in languages. People are working through language, in language, uh, through activism in languages every single day all around us. But but there seems to be you know that this channeling into what modern language is this is quite is becoming perhaps more um, problematic you know and I take the points about the, the everything we say and how we describe ourselves and what you know the um, institutional frameworks and and UCAS and all the rest of it but the, I think there's a really interesting uh, opening of our world opening of our imagination to. to to making those changes in the, in in a context in a cult, in cultural context in in a, our country where where we are surrounded by people you know who are doing this mm. this work in so many different ways. There's other people waiting to speak, but that was just an immediate response to what. Emma well, said. yes, no, thank you, Catherine. It is a, it's a very difficult question, and how we are actually able to to catch up, reflect, but at the same time push agendas is is, is something that we have no option but to struggle with. I think uh, Emmanuel is, is first and then Neil. Yeah, I, I was wondering what people thought of that um, name that, that we had in the, the call for the fellowship, which was Global Languages. How do people feel about that? Yeah, this, well, do, do we, while we think about that, possibly uh, if if Neil wants to come in, but that yes, that that question of how we we do try to to get beyond some of the hierarchies that were the subject of um, the first session today is a matter of, of urgent concern. Um, so we have got Neil and then Catherine. Thanks, Charles. Can you can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Um, first of all, thanks so much. For fantastic sessions today, really, really inspiring. 
on, on the particular question of, of naming, um, personally, um, you know, I like Emmanuel's idea of global languages and, and that the fellows, the new fellows have used. But m myself, I wonder about thinking whether we can work together more to make modern in modern languages mean global. That's something that came up right at the start of today. Um, you know, sometimes it does, many times it does not, but in my view, it should do. So that you know, would need a fairly concerted push really to make the modern in modern languages global rather, rather than European. W one reason why I think that, although it makes sense to talk about languages in the plural sort of full stop in some contexts, absolutely. I think in other contexts, it for me still makes powerful sense to talk about modern. And that's partly for the reason that, 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 that Stephen touched upon in his presentation about the language learning element in our discipline. It's absolutely fundamental. And for me, modern signals that. It, it signals as opposed to say classics, it signals that we are learning and teaching, not just the reading and, and the comprehension of languages, we're teaching the spoken and written production of language, something that incidentally needs more resource, so there's financial implications to that as well. But, but also for me, um, there are um, kind of epistemological implications of that, because that goes to the heart of this, you know, translating that, that translating cultures and, and Ari have shown is, is at the heart of the discipline. That that happens right from the start. If if you're a learner learning a, an, an L2, or, or uh, but even if you're a, a so-called native speaker, sort of teaching that in the UK context, you're doing that in a position of some externality, if, if you like, normally. So so the epistemological bit for me is is the sort of thing that Rory um, mentioned in passing in his really powerful presentation. I think Rory will correct me if I'm wrong, but it says something along the lines that, you know, I, I, being in the, in the UK in this, this, this slightly different setting, one can have research insights that are different from what might be possible always in, in the region, in, a, in another in another country where say that the target language is, is more dominant. So it's, it, and that for me is the real excitement and the real thing that, that modern languages, going right back to that early learning of, of the language and as Nell too most often can do, it's that sort of inside the outside interplay. So I'd love it if people could sort of somehow gather together examples of exactly what Rory was talking about there. Ways in which um, modern languages research um, which is distinct again from English as well, it's a language, but it's, it doesn't have that inside or outside of dynamic. Modern languages research produces insights, such as those that Rory was talking about, that are excellent research insights that can um, contribute on an international level to increasing the sum of human knowledge. Because of that, that inter interdependence, the interaction between the insider, outsider. So I'd love it if we could somehow collectively um, gather examples of that, where we think that being outside a particular area has enabled us to produce those insights within modern languages. Thanks. Thank you, Neil. I think that that your intervention demonstrates the the productivity of having this conversation explicitly and exploring every element of it without a a, a clear sense of where one, one, one needs necessarily to end that conversation. So thank you very much. Katrin. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, I, I think the um, interventions on this question have all been very interesting. And of course, we've had um, conversations about this before, and it's certainly something that's taxed me for a very long time. And uh, Wendy mentioned that um, the DFE is also wondering about this, and that again has a very long history about whether it really is appropriate to um, say modern foreign languages and that I've certainly always had difficulty with and I think many people have um, so dropping foreign would seem highly desirable global languages seems to me to have the problem that it focuses potentially attention on languages which have global reach and um, 
seems to yeah, sideline or certainly sort of put to the periphery languages which are very, very local. Um, and I think that localness of languages is, um, and of particular languages is hugely necessary to keep in mind as being just as important as the global reach of them. And particularly indigenous languages, um, ca calling them global languages works if you see it as a, as, a, as a pot that you can put every language in into, but not um, in terms of it's being an opposite of local potentially. Um, the difficulty I have with languages, societies and cultures, I think it's an excellent name for an institution, say, or for a journal or for something which has a particular identity. The difficulty I have, which is that it's, I mean, it, it, it works precisely against all the advantages that, say, history has. History has, is one word. It can engage with other disciplines as something which has a distinctive identity. If you have languages, societies, and cultures, um, it's a list of three things in which languages are just one. Um, and societies might be anything to do with the social sciences. Languages and cultures might work better. But I, I think there is a, is a difficulty if it, it, if it becomes a long list. And I think, I think the, the questions that we discuss around this question, I think they are very important. I think the name is important, the identity is important. Um, the difficulty seems to be that there is no easy solution. I think in the end, my preference is, is for languages um, and for making the argument that languages are absolutely interconnected with societies and with cultures and indeed with other disciplines um, on a case by case basis and in relation to particular institutional concerns, identities, activities um, and uh, work like that. But uh, I, I do realize that there are many different perspectives on this question and very, very good perspectives. Thank you, Catherine, and, and brought very much into focus by recent debate about the GCSE, for example, and the meaning that people attach to the uh, literally uh, and very narrowly to languages. Um, yes, thank you. Um, uh, some very interesting comments from Wendy in the chat. Um, um, I see that Gordela has raised a hand. Just, just before we come to Gordela, there were a couple of other things that just before, well, we'll probably go for a little bit longer than, than all 30 if people are okay with that. I mean, one of the things that it would be good to discuss was also just embedding the legacies of, of Aori, um, the gap that um, Ni uh, Nicola raised between where, we, where the AHRC might want us to be and where we would like to be. And also, uh, I'd like to conclude on this, uh, and that is the events uh, that we, that Emma and I can certainly talk about organising in the future. Sorry, uh, that's, so that's a couple of things that we do need to discuss before we conclude, but Gordela. Absolutely, thank you very much, Charles. Um, just um, so the discussion just now about the name, I think I think was really you know it seems such a small thing to do, but it actually goes to the heart of what we've been talking about before. You know the identity of uh, of the discipline. So I think it's important, but I would like to also now widen the field and um, uh, look at other conclusions we can draw from what we've discussed today. And to me, there are two areas of discussion that, that really emerge that we need to, to follow up on. One is the, um, um, the discipline looked at from the outside. So to what extent can we make sure that languages are seen to be at the heart of understanding other issues such as politics, such as history, etc. So, uh, you know, we've had some very powerful examples of how this was done in the RE project and how can we ensure this, this is more understood more widely. That's the external perspective. And then I think the other strand to pursue is really this, and to me, really, really urgent question of uh, how do we strengthen cohesion? How do we strengthen this holistic approach that we've, we've talked about? How, you know, and that I think can, you know, that's where what Charles was just referring to, the idea, the idea that, you know, putting on events that, that help people get together and to, to learn about each other's uh, approaches. 
that's that's a way forward. But I think these two strands need to be both pursued at the same time. And I was also wonder, wondering whether maybe the uh, AHRC fellows would like to come back. Who, you know, they spoke at the beginning. Maybe they they've sort of had some new thoughts as a result of what we've been doing today. That would be really interesting to me. Well, thank you, Gordon. I mean, the points that you're making about visibility, interconnectivity, and the series of rolling events in which we are uh, uh, doing this kind of work, absolutely fundamental. It would be great if we could, um, uh, if one or other of the fellows were to come back. So, Emmanuel, I can see, see, yeah. I mean, because in a sense, <laughs> yeah. this, is, this, is, this is the moment was the sort of the ending of the hour cycle how you really build that legacy, embed it in the infrastructures, in a people's awareness, and build on those platforms and retain those associations. So this is a, a really crucial moment. So, Emmanuel. Yeah, well, this morning in my presentation, I had my inspiration and the pictures of my, my students. And uh, it seems to me that that inequality of access to languages is something that goes throughout the thing because we've got their um, students who are multilingual, who have talent, but happen to be born in the, the wrong place in a way. And as we are going into a more inclusive uh, vision of languages that are not only the posh languages that have been traditionally um, studied, uh, in prestige universities, but we are also thinking about um, com community languages, home languages, whatever we, we call them. I, I think we may be missing also on lots of strengths uh, by including people like that in, in a much wider understanding maybe of what academia is all about. Because um, I, I, think, I, I think it was Catherine who was uh, saying a moment ago that we are behind in universities and we have to catch up and, and maybe we don't tap into that uh, human reservoir of experience and, yeah, different backgrounds that, that would enrich us all. So, yeah, yeah. I think that's, that's it. Com completely. Yeah. I mean, I think if we can just... I, I think these are the questions. I mean, one of the things that... Sorry, I, I see Michelle. Yeah, Michelle, please, go ahead. Yeah, um, I was just going to respond to the, the invitation to, to um, offer comments. Um, and I think a couple of takeaway points from you this afternoon have been to do around that I will pay particular attention to going forward is size of grants. So that is something that the AHRC have asked us to, to consider. Um, just from listening to to the presentations and also from previous experience i think it's important to to recognize the differences that different types of grants and sizes of grants can have in, in different places and um i know that um we didn't hear hear from catherine a lot about um working in partnership but i think working in partnership with small grants as communities is something um that can be achieved sometimes where where and opens up partnerships and we're not just within the the academy um and obviously i i picked up on some of the comments in the the chat both um Michal and um i think a couple of others beat me to it in terms of what do we think of ourselves as and the the, the challenges of the term global uh, for the indigenous languages and also how we um, to, to remember that our language research and I'm talking about the research of indigenous language re researchers can be but isn't always internal perspectives um, within the UK as well it's not just an external perspective so some really good takeaways for me and thanks very much for for them thank you uh, Michelle um, absolutely um Nicola yeah just very briefly because I know people want to get on but um I think I don't want to say anything particular because I think I've been trying to listen today and take things away but I guess the one thing I would say is that everything that you've raised are the kind of things that we the three of us have already been talking about so you know it's great to hear that we are thinking along 
we're asking the same questions and um, you know we need to keep thinking um, as we listen to you over the coming weeks as well but thanks yeah, I mean, and also I'm just looking, picking up some of the points in the, the chat, the question of uh, living languages, that's certainly something that, that we, we can be thinking about. Questions of levelling up, inequality of opportunity, rights, they are absolutely basic to any consideration of this kind. The question of inclusivity uh, is something that we'll be debating in exactly one month's um, time as a community. Uh, at, um, and we will... Um, and I think we will conclude in a minute by just talking about some of the events that we can, uh, Emma and I can think about um, putting together. But Catherine, you have your hand up. It's just a brief point, and I was thinking at uh, this conversation the, the, at the beginning of the early projects. I think we're we're all touching on this different in different ways. One of the things that we all knew that we had to do was reach outside the academy. It's, you know, if we were to make transformative impact within institutions, within the academy, we had to think of what was happening outside, you know, and the work that everyone has been doing in policy and schools, et cetera, was about, you know, really enlivening uh, languages in schools, for stopping, you know, stopping that, um, working, militating against this crisis in schools, which was really stopping the access to, to universities. And, the, and the, the incredible work that's happening outside the academy is showing, as we said before, the sort of uh, language activist community that we, we live in. I think what we haven't yet um, really managed to uh, solve, if we can, is, is what this conversation is about, is, is that how do we bring these enormous insights and what we are learning outside back into the institution? And, uh, you know, and I think it's happening in all sorts of ways, you know, there's a lot of really exciting things happening. But I think one of the things that's, that's halting, uh, that, that might halt some of the thinking is that if we, as we do that, we would will have to reshape languages departments massively. And reshaping man, language departments massively as they are now has real knock-on effects for, for people, for jobs, for all sorts of things, you know. And I think that's that's the sort of um, conundrum. I think that's a space that's that's really important for us to to think about. We might not be able to get beyond it, but as uh, you know, I, I I think it's that sort of inside outside. Some of you will laugh now because I've talked about the hokey cokey of language research in this because you do what you can do outside, and then you try and bring it inside, and it's you know, and then and then you get to this point where it's incredibly difficult to move on because of institutional structures, which we all know about, but because we also know that this actually would mean if we're going to go down this line, which we think is really exciting, it means a, a real um realignment of what modern languages to call them that departments are now and that's a huge political that's a huge political issue as part from, and personnel and human issue apart from anything else and i think that's that's it i won't say anymore i think that i just think that there's a knot there that we're not getting there is and there has to be a will to do that because the implications are massive um but i think it is only by talking as a a collective entity and moving as far as one can collaboratively in this direction and then addressing and not being afraid to address the issues that, that, that are raised institutionally uh, and also dealing with the massive issue of, uh, of precariousness that that we we, we can move forward um, so I, I think that there has to be a, a will uh, and a shared will to do that um, um, yeah, I, 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 sorry that people do have to leave. Uh, um, and of course, absolutely, we'll, we'll conclude in, in just a second with uh, follow-up uh, events that we can organise. But just before we do that, if there's anyone else that would like to make a point. Okay, well, well I mean, one of the, there are a number of things. I think so a condensed strategic session of this kind is very useful um, because it raises the issues that we have to be concerned with on a daily basis, both institutionally and in our own research and the connections that we seek to develop with uh, 
but with the communities in which we're based, with the glam sector, for example, with creative artists, um, uh, uh, and uh, and with the education sector more broadly. I think we can organise a number of events of this kind. Uh, Emma might want to, to, to say something on this. For example, Hillary's point about global challenges, there is... Um, it would be very good to organise a, a question largely on uh, around the, the question uh, along the lines of what have we learned and how can we embed that in this discussion that we're having about where we're moving in a disciplinary as a disciplinary community what what has have we learned through uh, global challenges would be one another of course is to be speaking about the things that are happening uh, in uh, in higher education, formally with what is happening uh, at other levels uh, of the education sector, and how do we embed that uh, question within what we do? Another event would be to thinking about all uh, post hourly the associations, platforms, connections, how we maintain them and develop that, and of course to be discussing uh, very clearly. Uh, we do need to uh, repeat. Uh, event with the AHRC fellows a little bit further down the line, um, precisely to take up the issues that they've very uh, powerfully raised. So I think that is that is a very broad plan of activity. Emma, do you want to come in briefly with the UCML? I mean, the, the only thing just to add is that we have the summer plenary, so we could we could host something as part of that. Yeah, I think I think that would be work, would work very strongly. I mean, I mean, part of the the renewed idea of the, the IMLR is to be working very much strategically and to be uh, working, uh, as you know, extremely strongly with the UCML. So, I mean, maybe something along the sustainability line, something like Catherine was was mentioning, because you know we're not really I mean, we don't want to talk about crisis, do we? But we're definitely not out of the out of the woods. Um, as as various people on this call know very well, so yeah. that might be. I was I was sort of thinking something along the lines of, of the thing that we ran in twenty nineteen, which was a I can't remember exactly what it was called, but we we ended up producing a toolkit for um for, for sort of surviving. Oh, was it surviving and thriving in difficult times? Something like that. I think that was actually quite a helpful, quite helpful for the community. Um. So maybe yeah, something along those lines. We we kind of rethinking languages or modern languages for you know the sustainability of university departments. Mm. Yeah, I mean that's well, that will, certainly. I mean that's the um, and really sort of making sure that infrastructure and institutional institutions are able to uh, keep up with and at least demonstrate institutional awareness of all that is happening around us. I think we have gone a, a lot uh, further beyond what our original plan uh, and people do have to um, leave. And just say, yeah, another point about absolutely, the question of working with language cent centers uh, and language teaching and its integration uh, within everything that we do is extremely well made. So I think we'll conclude here with just a massive thank you for the um, presentations that we've heard, for the way in which everyone who's spoken has spoken very powerfully and that they've condensed what they've had to say in very, um, very short interventions that allow us really to be thinking um, further forward and, um, uh, and to really see this as a platform from which we can develop um, further connected events that really do address issues that are at the very heart of what we're, um, what we're all about. So a massive thank you to everyone. And um, we will um, be meeting again shortly. Okay, so very best to everyone.